And today we will be reviewing the questions in the workbook in the area of real property. I am a first year property teacher, so this falls within my area of expertise, so hopefully that will enable me to clarify some things that you may have found difficult, um, depending on various challenges you may have encountered and also what the coverage was in your own first year property class. Lots of first year property classes cover subjects that are not real property subjects, strictly speaking, and even many first year property uh, classes that do focus on and cover, to some degree, the real property topics that are also the bar examined topics may leave out some of them. That is, it, there's a lot, each of them in a way conceptually a kind of tub on its own bottom. Um, it's not, a, the subject itself is not conceptually linked and unified the way that contracts or torts is, and so each of its pieces have to be learned in kind of a standalone way. And some people who teach the first year property class just elect to leave some of these out, as they may or may not cover landlord tenant law, they may or may not cover mortgages or recording acts or future interests or adverse possession, all of these potential real property topics. Um, and there's a lot of vocabulary here. I mean, all areas of law have their distinctive vocabulary. Real property has a lot of distinctive vocabulary. And if you really understand the terminology, Many of the rules are not very difficult, but if you don't understand the words in those rules, then it doesn't do you any good. Even if the rule is simple, there's no way to, to apply it if you don't understand what the terms mean. So in using the materials that we have, your materials include a glossary, I would call it, of, ter of terms that begin on page 91 and go to page 98. So in the course of your own review, do refer to that if there's terms that you encounter whose meaning you do not know. That's an instruction that I also give to my first year property students. If you haven't been doing it throughout all of your legal education, then there are probably terms here that you may have sort of skipped over while you're reading them in a case and you can't tell whether they matter or not and it's easy to, to skip over them. We'll be using a lot of these terms today, of course, but feel free to check or to ask me if you want clarification. The other first piece of reordering of the pages that I would like you to do is page 90 Right, is the essential real property vocabulary list. So as I work my way through this chapter, I checked against this list to make sure that, we that it was all covered, right? that every vocabulary word that showed up on this list was somewhere in the material that we were going to review. Uh, I think that they are, but there are actually a couple of terms I would like you to add to that list. So you should annotate this list by adding, and you could add them in their appropriate alphabetical place or at the bottom or whatever, um, between heir at law and inter vivos, you should add the term inquiry notice, which has some real property relevance. Between joint tenancy and license, you should insert the word lease, which is of course one of the estates and land. Between tenancy in common and time of the essence, you should insert term of years. And you might want to make some note to yourself that the term of years is in some ways the traditional name of the same interest that we call the lease. That is, the term of years and the lease are really the same thing. With warranty deed, you might want to expand it. Again, whether you add, because some of these are subcategories of each other, you want to be sure that you're aware of differences between the so-called general warranty deed and the special warranty deed. One of these contains more of the covenants of title than the other one does, and we will be talking about that. It's a small correction, but I think it actually is significant for reasons that we'll talk about when we talk about future interests. The entry on this list says reversionary interest, but as I understand and classify the grantor's retained interests, it actually should say reversionary interests, of which there are several. That is, the reversionary interest is really the name of a category of grantor's retained interest and not the name of an, of an actual retained interest. Right? The reversion is an actual retained interest. And reversion ought to be in there, and is not. Right? So reversion just by itself. The other thing, just for your general familiarity, is this list includes the term subject to defeasance. And this is a limitation on various possible fee interests. Right, some fee interests are subject to being cut off in various ways. 
but there are other things that an interest might be subject to, right? So whether you add as other things under subject to, the class gift may be subject to open, which is also, that is, it's a, it's a synonym for subject to partial divestment. And then there's another interest that is subject to complete divestment. And we'll talk about this when we talk about uh, the various fee interests and future interests. So with the glossary, in one place you could put the, the essential real property vocabulary list on top of the glossary. And as we work through the chapter, the section of the book, you can go back and forth and check off as we go along the terms that are essential for the resolution of the particular questions that we work on. And then at the end, we can take a look, make sure we've really covered everything. And if there are any vocabulary words that somehow didn't come up in a question or that I didn't mention or you didn't notice, we'll make sure I say a few words about them so that it's complete. Yes, quick question, if any. You said that the subject to open is synonymous with subject to open. Yes, that's the open class. They're, and again, just different authors in different cases use different terminology, but they're otherwise identical. So you want to make sure you're familiar both with the bar language and where, how the bar language correlates to the language that might have been used when you were taught this material and regardless of how you were taught, language that you may encounter in cases because there are these various synonymous terms. So, of course, since I give this advice about every, about every subject, I certainly give the advice about property with which our materials begin. Don't blow off studying it. And from my point of view, don't blow off studying any of it, including present and future interests and the rule against perpetuities, which we will talk about not at its complete length because I actually have a day-long, eight-hour lecture on present and future interests, the rule against perpetuities and all of its reforms. Just that subject. There's a lot there. You don't have to know it like that. But to be able to solve easy, what I regard as easy, rule against perpetuities questions, if you understand the rule and its operation, the questions that appear on the MBE are easy. They're laughably easy. If you don't know it, you don't know it. And you're not going to be able to tell one of these answers from the other. You're going to be guessing or wasting time or confused. But if you know it, they are actually not asking questions about very fine-brained, gray, difficult areas in the rule. It's all right down the middle. And so hopefully we can come to at least a degree of mastery that will make that, um, that, will make that available and possible. So why don't we jump in with question number one. And we'll talk, again, with your essential vocabulary list sitting next to you. Begin aloud. And again, as we go along, I'll be reminding you about some of our general strategies about multiple choice questions, including when to read the question stem, right? So this one is kind of right in the middle, right? It's not a tiny, short question. And as you probably noticed in looking at the property questions, almost none of them are tiny, short questions. Just the nature of the subject is such that there's a lot of explanation. Even if the question's easy, it takes a lot of setup to get to that point. So, you know, it's one where we're not too often going to be able to skip or eliminate or stuff like that. So, at, read the question first, but then we'll take it from the top. One year after the agreement was entered into, the state product condemnation action All right, so there, there, let me say a couple of things. The first thing is, as this would be set up on the bar exam now, only the actual call of the question, right, in the condemnation action is minor entitled to compensation, would be the part you read if you just jumped to the stem, right? Because we've read one sentence back here, right, I hope it's apparent that what the question is asking, this is a takings doctrine case, so it has a little con law in there, but what it's really asking is whether this person, minor, has the sort of interest that is covered by the takings clause, right? So you're then going to be reading the facts, asking, do they have that sort of interest? Again, we don't know. We could look at the answer choices ahead of time, whether you're also going to have to properly classify that interest or not, right? So it's, it's going to be yes, no, right? Because is he entitled to compensation is the same thing as asking, does he have a property interest of the sort covered by the takings clause? And then it may be, yes, it's this kind, yes, it's that kind, et cetera. But until we know what sort of interest he has at all, we don't know whether we're going to be able to classify it as a property interest or something lesser that's not entitled to compensation. So now, from the top. Mm 
Right, in whatever quantities you desire. What interest does minor have? What interest or interests does minor have? He is not. He has something else. Right, and it has associated with it this easement. Right, the right to enter is the easement. The right to remove the stuff that's there is the profit. Right, so a, a profit is typically covered, co included with has, has an easement that comes along with it. Sometimes it can be implied in. Right, this is just a right to enter. If just to say a little bit about a profit, and you can now cross or you know, check easement and profit off on our list. The the profit, which is the right to remove will imply an easement, right? Because giving somebody the right to take X numbers of bushels of apricots off of the trees on Black Acre isn't worth anything if they would be a trespasser getting on, right? But if the person who's granting the interest cares where and how they come on, then they may give them an easement like just to use the paved road, you have to come in from the west, you can't come in from over there, you can only bring this kind of truck, you can, right? So if that were the situation, you wouldn't just say, 50 bushels of apricots a year, you would couple it with the easement that actually instructs how they come on, right? So this is an easement and a profit. Are these interests covered by the takings clause? <laughs> yes, they are, right? They are among the lesser property interests. They are not like the fee, right? But in a way, this question has made it even easier for you um, because they're not tricking you, right? We've been told it was acknowledged and duly recorded. Basically, this might be a slight overstatement, I'd have to think about exceptions, any recordable interest is covered by the takings clause, right? Because what's recordable are interests in property that would potentially negatively implicate the title being passed by the seller. And this means, it, if we want to think about it, and there are lots of metaphors in this area, the holder of the easement and profit has a piece of the title, right? That is, if the, if the owner were to sell it, it would pass subject to the easement and the profit. And that means if the government is going to be compensating the old owner of the parcel, it's not only the owner of the parcel who's suffering a loss, it's also the owner of the easement and the profit, and that is what covers him. Yes? Right, but it's the profit. Right, right. But an easement alone is also compensable under the takings clause. It is. Well, it is because the, the, way, to, the way to think about it is that if you own a, a piece, of, if you own a parcel of land, I mean, I will now use, hopefully. It's interest in profit. It's not accessory interest. Correct. Right, it's a use right, right? If we think of our, the two parcels, right, and one of them, the dominant parcel, which may be a word on your list, Right, this is black acre, this is white acre. Okay. If this is condemned and taken, right, compensation is due. But some of it goes to the owner of black acre because the owner of black acre has suffered a loss, right? That is black acre is worth less than black acre plus an easement to cross white acre. Right? Especially this is the public highway, let's say, and there's no other easy way out, right? The owner of White Acre, subject to the easement, owns less than the owner of White Acre free of the easement, right? So when we think about the government paying 100% of the fair market value of White Acre, it doesn't all go to the owner of White Acre. Some of it goes to the owner of Black Acre who has the easement to cross. And that would be true even if the owner of this easement were not the owner of Black Acre, right? That is, even if it were not connected to another parcel, and we can draw different pictures for that, right? So the easement is the compensable interest. The profit, maybe yes, maybe no, but it's got this easement implied into it. And then we've got to look at our answer choices. Yeah, question? Just for the purposes of an essay, then, mm -hmm. this would come up as well, an essay, essay okay? And yes, and here, it's actually set, they're both here, right? The privilege to enter Stoneacre, that's the easement, and remove, that's the profit. Because if all he were granted was as much gravel as you can take out of Stoneacre, we'd be implying the easement. But here, he's being granted the easement, the right to enter and take away. Yes, although every profit has an easement implied into it because you can't, 
right? You can't otherwise get there. Yes. Yeah. Right. Well, and then we've got to look at our answer choices and see how fine they make us slice the bologna, right? But we have enough now to answer the question, although we'll want to look at all of its facts. So now look, let's look at our answer choices, then we'll double back. So now, right, we know he has a compensable interest, so we're going to be on the yes because side. Which is the better answer? Right. And it's easy here. If those are all you have to choose between, right, because that right to remove, right, the, the right to enter might be a license. It might. We have to see the whole, we need to know all our facts, although a license is typically not recordable or not recorded, right, revocable, right. But if that's all we're choosing between, all you have to know is what a profit is, right. So this is like a classic one where if you know the terminology, the question is going to answer itself. Right? Now, read the rest of the facts just so we can sure. finish it. Right, so there, is some, there are some other elements of easement law about that, who has to maintain the easement, what counts as overuse of the easement, and who can exclude, right? But, he, and, and, but what's made clear here is that our easement holder, right, has the right to exclude everyone except, you know, to use our white acre, black acre example, right, the person who holds the easement has the right to exclude everyone except the owner of the, uh, the servient tenement, that is the burdened estate. Not relevant for this question, right? Might be relevant for other questions that could be asked out of the same facts, not relevant for this particular question, right? We know enough once we know this person has a profit, all right? Yes? Do we know enough by reading the question to answer this question to consider the fact that because the government, the state's going to bring a condemnation action, and we, and we say with certainty that um, an eminent can have a government situation and it's going up against the state that no one is ever going to win. We're told enough. Um, it, Again, there's a little takings clause law in here, right? A condemnation action to take Stoneacre for a highway interchange. Property owner's always going to lose. If it were just in a condemnation action, we might wonder, but for a highway, you're losing, right? That's, you know. Don't, don't consider it from that point of view, okay? All right, onward to number two. Uh, this one is so short. You might as well start at the top. <laughs> right, so start with the facts. Right. Yep. Testator devised his farm to my son Selden for life, going to Selden's children and their heirs and sons. Selden, a widower, had two unmarried adult children. Okay. So you're not going to encounter any conveyance simpler than this one. Right? This is to S for life, then to S's children. Right? And the words and their heirs and the signs just mean in fee simple absolute. Right? They don't have anything. The children are have something. The children's heirs have nothing. The words and their heirs and the signs just means in fee simple absolute. As do the words and their heirs, as do no words at all. Right? That is, this is the same conveyance as to, to my son Selden for life, then to Selden's children, period. Right? Because the, the, a conveyance is always interpreted to be the fullest interest compatible with the language, the largest interest compatible with the language. And the largest interest compatible with the language 2x is 2x in fee simple absolute. And so those are actually the words that are read in when they are missing. Right? Presumptively, everyone takes the largest estate compatible with the language of the conveyance. Right? So that's just by way of background. Okay? Would this be like one of those No. Nope. That's when there's a separate grant to the heirs of the grantee. To A for life, then to A's heirs. That's the Shelley's case situation. That is not this situation. This is to S for life, then to S's children. Right? Not to anyone's heirs. And their heirs and the signs only, only means in fee simple. Okay? All right, go on. Now we've got our question. All right, so this is how do we classify the remainder, right? How do we know it's a remainder at all, that remainder is the category we're dealing with here? Well, some future interests are remainders. Some future interests are things that are not remainders. 
Some future interests are reversionary interests and some future interests are executory interests. How do we know that this is a remainder? And what's a remainder? but rather takes upon the natural termination of the prior estate. So the remainder is an interest in a third party that takes upon the natural, becomes possessory upon the natural termination of the prior estate. So the prior estate has to have a natural termination. If the prior estate is a fee, it has no natural termination and the interest that follows cannot be a remainder. But the life estate is an interest that terminates naturally. We don't know when, right, but we know it's going to. Another way that I sometimes put that is the question is when and not whether the prior estate will terminate. So it's going to be followed by a remainder. The question is, what kind of remainder? So, what kind of remainder? Is it possible for the life estate holder to have more children during the life estate? It isn't. It's a legal question. I mean, we're talking about son Selden. Is it possible for son Selden to generate more members of the remainder man class? Yes. And it is not a biological question. It's a legal question because there is an irrebuttable presumption of lifetime fertility in the law. It would not actually matter if this guy were surgically sterilized and that was known to everyone and he had signed an enforceable agreement never to adopt, not that there is such an agreement. None of that would matter. There is an irrebuttable presumption of lifetime fertility for both men and women in the common law for present and future interest interpretation and rule against perpetuity spirit purposes. So they cannot be indefeasibly vested because they are members of an open class. Now I could say more about why that is, right? But that's the short version. No member of an open class can have an indefeasibly vested interest because their interest can be cut down right, by the appearance of other class members. And so, what is our answer? To be vested subject to complete defeasance means that someone else can cut you off completely. Can these children be cut off completely? No. And so? Yes. This is the classic vested subject to open, vested subject to partial divestment or to partial defeasance situation. Right. The person who has an interest as a member of an open class has an interest that is vested subject to open is the language that I usually use in teaching. Vested subject to partial defeasance is the same thing. Right. Vested subject to complete defeasance, I teach as vested subject to total divestment. That's the language that I use in teaching it and maybe the language that you encountered, so you want to make sure you understand that those are synonyms. Right? The interest vested subject to total divestment is an interest, and we'll, we'll hopefully we'll encounter one, right, that is vested, but upon the happening of a condition, is divested. Right? So another way of understanding that, again, you can Put it, you can note it here, you can note it on the vocabulary list or check it in the glossary. Right? The holder of the remainder vested subject to total divestment, right, where the way that I would classify the interest that we see here, that is named here at D, is to A for life, then to B, but if X occurs to C, B is the holder of a remainder subject to total divestment. Right? To A for life, then to B. But if X occurs, then to C. B is the holder of remainder subject to total divestment. That is, he can be totally cut off upon the happening of a condition, and I, since I will not be giving you my whole future interest lecture, we're just using this shorthand, when I call a condition X, I mean what I teach as a true condition, I call it a true condition, when it is something that might or might not happen. So the death of a person is not a true condition because the death of a person is certain to happen. We don't know when, but we know whether it will happen. It will, right? So if it's worded to A for life, then to B, but when B dies to C, B only has a life estate, right? Because the death of B is not a true condition. Similarly, the passage of time is not a true condition. 
So to A for life, then to B, five, and five years later to C, now B has a term of years. Not a remainder subject to divestment, not a remainder of any kind, but just a term of years. Because the passage of five years is something which is certain to occur. It is not a true condition. Right? Pretty much everything else is a true condition. Everything but the death of persons and the passage of time is a true condition, and hence, in the case of the remainder subject to total divestment, is operating as a divesting condition. Right? That is to A for life, then to B. But if X occurs, then to C. The occurrence of X divests B. By contrast, when the condition puts someone in and operates as a vesting condition on that person, then that person has either a contingent remainder or an executory interest, as the case may be. And there are all kinds of conversations among the experts about how to classify, even in the example that I gave you, right? To A for life, then to B, but if X occurs, then to C. What does C have? Right? X is a true condition, and it's a condition precedent upon C taking. And it's a condition precedent upon C vesting, right? That is, C's interest is not vested, neither in ownership nor in possession, while B's is. So let me write this conveyance up, just even though I'm using the same one over and over, just because it can be helpful to have it before us in the future interest area. So, yeah. To A for life, then to B. But if X occurs, then to C. Okay? This is a life estate. There are no two ways about it. Okay? This makes B's interest a, well, there's actually two words, right? Two parts. It's a vested remainder subject to complete divestment. So it actually is a kind of vested remainder, right? As distinct from to A for life, then to B, period, in which case B has the indefeasibly vested remainder because B's interest cannot fail to become possessory. The only question is when and not whether. In fact, even the death of B during the life of A will not prevent that remainder from becoming possessory because that remainder in B is a piece of property that B can pass by will or intestate as the case may be. An indefeasibly vested remainder is like the tables and chairs. You can leave it by will. It can pass in test date. It's coming in, the only question that, at, which is to say becoming possessory. The traditional language for becoming possessory is the remainder coming in. Because what, it, what we're really talking about historically, and believe me, I will not take you through a thousand years of the development of future interest law. I could, but I won't, is this is the right of B to enter into the land formerly held by A. So it's, when we talk about the remainder coming in, what we really mean is it's B coming in, literally, right? That is, he, he cannot be denied entry to the land after the death of A as the holder of the indefeasibly vested remainder. Here, right, classifying for C has slight nuance because C might have either of two things. What are the two things that C might have? C might have an executory interest, right? And that's what we, that would be the correct way to classify if what we imagine happen, happening is A has it, dies. B comes in, X occurs, C comes in, right? If the occurrence of X cuts off B after B is already in, then C is taking as an executory interest holder, right? And it, it is not, it's not a mere pun which is a helpful mnemonic. It actually is etymologically related that the executory interest has the word cut in it. It cuts off, and that is really what it means. Right? Again, that's not just some coincidence. The executory interest cuts off the interest of the prior holder. Right? C cuts off B in a way completely unlike B's relationship to A. Right? B waits patiently, you'll sometimes see in the materials, for the death of A in order to come in. C cuts off B. On the other hand, this condition could occur during the life of A. Maybe, right? We, we don't know because I've left it in this very blank form. 
And if x is the kind of condition that could occur during the life of A, B will never come in. Right? C will come in immediately at the death of A. Right? C will not cut off B. C will take upon the natural termination of the prior estate because the happening of X will not cut off A. It doesn't interfere with A's life estate. It interferes with the ownership of the remainder. Right? So it may be that the occurrence of X during the life of A will now convert C from being the holder of something which we have yet to classify into the indefeasibly vested remainderman. Right? And if that is the case, then what would C have? How would C be taking? If C takes immediately upon the termination of A's, uh, the estate in A, the life estate in A? Hmm? That's the interest that C will have when C has it. But what is the name of the future interest that C takes? Now, springing and, and shifting are kinds of executory interest. There's a kind of remainder. Yes, then C would be taking as the contingent remainder holder. What is the contingency on C? The happening of X, right? So that would make this to A for life, and if at A's death X has occurred, to C, right? C would now be taking naturally, as it were, right? That is taking upon the natural termination of the prior estate. Now, this is the situation which, when I teach the entire, you know, Baroque structure that is present and future interest law, I describe as a true tie. Right? That is, if X is the kind of condition that could as easily occur during the life of A as after, right? because it isn't connected to A, B, or C. It's not a thing A, B, or C can do. It's, but if a Republican is elected president, then to C. Right? That is, it's a condition, a true condition. Don't know if it's going to occur. But it has nothing to do with A, B, and C. It is not in any way under any of their control. Right? Then we have a true tie. We really don't know whether, we don't know whether C is going to take, and we don't know how C will take. We don't know if C will take from B or C will take from A. That is cutting B off, taking from A upon the natural termination of A's estate. We do not know and we cannot know at the time we have to classify the interest. For historical reasons, there are various, there are old rules and historical reasons that say, in the case of the true tie, you must break the tie in favor of the remainder. That any interest that can be a contingent remainder must be classified as a contingent remainder. But the reason for that relates to a rule that was an antecedent rule to the rule against perpetuities, a rule older than the rule against perpetuities, right? a doctrine called the destructibility of contingent remainders. Most jurisdictions now do not have the destructibility of contingent remainders. It's been superseded by the rule against perpetuities. But the cases that say any interest that can be classified as a contingent remainder must be classified as a contingent remainder are still around. They haven't gone anywhere. So that's the argument for contingent remainder. The argument for executory interest is that if we fully classify for B, not just the type of the remainder, but what it's a remainder in, we would say what B has is a vested remainder subject to complete divestment in fee simple subject to executory limitation because it's possible that B could be cut off after B comes in. Right? The vested remainder subject to complete divestment captures the possibility that B will be cut off before he even comes in. But what it's a remainder in is not a remainder in the fee simple absolute, because if it were a remainder in the fee simple absolute, that would mean once B comes in, he can never be kicked out. But that's not true. The happening of X will kick him out. So what B has is the vested remainder subject to complete divestment in fee simple subject to executory limitation. The kind of fee simple you have when the happening of an event can kick you out in favor of someone else, in this case C. Some people think, as a matter of classificatory consistency, if B has a, any kind of interest in fee simple subject to executory limitation, that the next interest must be the executory interest because they're a pair, right? The fee simple subject to executory limitation goes with the executory interest. And they would say, 
How can a fee simple subject to executory limitation right, be followed by a remainder of any kind? Right? Because no remainder follows the fee, ever. Right? So, you know, people who care about all these technicalities keep themselves up nights worrying about it. If you can even understand most of what I just said, you know enough future interest law to be fine on the bar. And sort of the, the punchline, I suppose, if you have now spent a few minutes following this, is the bar exam will never ask you to make a distinction as fine as this. That is, executory interest and contingent remainder will not both be in the answer choices. It will be one or the other. They don't get into any of this kind of crazy stuff. Right? And so you're not going to be tripped up because you don't know whether or not the jurisdiction has destructibility, right? which is, again, incredibly obscure, ancient law. Right? But being able to follow every part of a classification of, of a conveyance as, com as complicated as this is just about as far as you have to go, except for some class gift rules. Right? So for a conveyance that has no class gift in it, you're very unlikely to see anything more complicated than this. Right? That is one present interest, one future interest, one present interest, two future interests, and the two future interests stand in a special relationship to each other. Huh? Now, by the way, right, we might as well do a perpetuities analysis since we're here and since it's coming down the line. So, any perpetuities problem here? A's life estate? No, it's present and possessory. No present possessory interest ever violates the rule because the rule against perpetuities is a rule about postponed vesting. Anyone in possession today is also vested today, and so their interest cannot possibly violate the rule. What about to be? B's remainder. Doesn't violate the rule because there's sort of two lines of analysis or argument here. It's already vested. It was vested at conveyance. Right? That's the first part of the analysis. The vested remainder subject to total divestment is a vested remainder. Now, annoyingly, the vested remainder subject to complete divestment, that is the vested remainder subject to open, is not vested, even though it has the word vested in its name. But the vested remainder subject to total divestment is vested, and it never violates the rule. That is why they might put one of these in there, right? Because it will trip up people who are thinking, they're counting, they're wondering. It doesn't matter. The vested remainder subject to complete divestment never violates the rule. It's vested at conveyance. It's vested at creation, even though, as we've seen, it is subject to divestment. Right? But it is vested at conveyance. What about C's interest? I mean, that's the vulnerable one, right? Because that's the one that doesn't, that's not in a category that's automatically safe, right? The life estate, automatically safe because it's present and possessory. The vested remainder subject to complete divestment, automatically safe. Like the indefeasibly vested remainder, it's vested at creation. The executory interest and the contingent remainder, not necessarily. So those are the ones where you have to do the perpetuities analysis. So do the perpetuities analysis. That's right, and so? Yeah, the interest in C violates the rule. Because, as put this way, X is a condition that could happen tomorrow or never. That's what I mean when I say it's a true condition. A true condition is something that could happen tomorrow or never. Now, there are ways of getting around this, right? There are ways that X could be filled in that wouldn't violate the rule. If X is tied to the life of A or B, Right? So if X is, but if B does thus and such, then to C. Right? Now, the point is not that it's under B's control, but that it's limited by B's lifespan. Right? That is, B will definitively do or fail to do all the things that B will ever do during B's own lifetime. B is a life and being at conveyance, and we have no perpetuities problem. So if the condition itself is tied to someone who is a life in being, that changes everything, then it doesn't violate the rule. But there's a, that's the difference between, but if B ever uses the land for a tavern to C, that interest in C is valid, and, but if the land is ever used for a tavern, then to C, which is not valid. Right? It matters. You have to read with care 
whether the vesting condition is one that is certain to occur or conclusively fail to occur within the perpetuities period. But typically on the bar exam and in most questions about this, it actually will occur during one of the lives in being or never, right? like, like if B ever uses the land for a tavern. Right? B, using the land for a tavern, never even puts us into the 21-year perpetuity period because it will happen or conclusively fail to happen when B dies. And B is a life and being at conveyance. So we're not even using the period. Right? Analyses that actually force us into the period are relatively rare. Generally, it's all happening inside the lives of identified persons. Right? And then keeping in mind various fertility issues. All right, so we use that question dwelt on that question just to get that vocabulary out, so we've gotten through a lot more of our vocabulary words, and also conceptually, it will allow us to move more quickly through some of what else is to come. All right, so now we can fill in our table on page 55 pretty readily. So, sir, next person over, looking at the table. What are the words that are used to create the fee simple? Some examples. Yep, that'll do it all by itself. 2x will do it. What else? Yes, to x and his heirs. To x and his heirs and the signs. And of course, although in a way shockingly, this didn't used to be true, 2x in fee simple. That is, you can actually be totally explicit about it. You don't have to use these code words. Again, shockingly, that did not used to be true. And the, use, the estate that used to be presumptively created was the life estate, and to X and fee simple would not create a fee. But now it will. Right? So it can be very explicit or less explicit. Right? To A, to A and his heirs are the commonest. Does that leave any future interest in the grantor? Or in a third party? Right. Okay, next line, the life estate. Yep. Yeah, we'll get it all filled in, hopefully. Yep, that's the classic, to X for life. Sometimes to X, but at the death of X to so-and-so, right? So you want to be aware of that, right? Don't get too caught up in the grammar, right? That is something that just purports to be an outright gift to X. is not necessarily a gift of the fee if something that's, that is phrased as a condition isn't a true condition, right? To X, but when X dies, to B, right? That's a life estate also, so you have to read. It's not an entire, you know, this process has a mechanical aspect, but it's not totally mechanical. You still have to read and think. What follows the life estate in the grantor? So if it's just to A for life, I tend to start at the beginning of the alphabet, to A for life, nothing more is said. What is the interest retained by the grantor? Yes, that's the reversion. That is the reversion. The grantor's interest that follows the life estate is the reversion. And in a third party, one or another of the kinds of remainders. So again, there are lots of them, as we have seen. Right? But the life estate is an estate that terminates naturally. It's followed by a reversion in the grantor and by one of the various remainders in a grantee. The determinable life estate. I'm sorry, the determinable estate, not the terminal li life estate. So life estates can actually be determinable, but this is also the fee. Let's just do the determinable fee, okay. which is easier, okay? That's one of them. Yes. Yes. So while, so long as, during, until, what I call these in general, are words of durational limitation. But not like five years, but words of durational or temporal limitation. Um, so long as, during, while, until. Those are the big four. Possibility of reverter. Possibility of reverter is what that is called. And you just have to memorize that as if it were one word. Right? The possibility of reverter. 
if you think about it too much, you'll never remember it, right? And you'll go back and forth. And again, you're not going to have to generate it. You're only going to have to recognize it. But it's the possibility of reverter. That's the grantor's retained interest that follows any prior interest on durational or temporal limitation. Not like four or five years. That's a different thing. But this while, so long as, during, et cetera. And then what's the future interest in the third party? Don't worry about shifting versus springing. They're not words of significant legal meaning. Yes. And then I'll make a comment about them. We have it all filled in. And then the estate subject to condition subsequent should really be subject to condition subsequent slash subject to executory limitation because they're created the same way. And how is that? What is that way they are created? What's the language of creation? Yes, these are words of logical limitation. But if provided that, on condition that, words of logical limitation rather than words of temporal limitation. Slash subject to executory limitation. Because you don't call it subject to a condition subsequent when it's going to a third party. You have to know who comes in next in order to be able to classify properly for this reason. Yes. But if on condition that, provided that, what is the grantor's retained interest here? Right of entry, right of re-entry. Power of termination is the other one. They all mean the same thing. Right of entry, right of re-entry, power of termination. And what's the future interest in the third party? Yes, this is also the executory interest. So what you see, it has a weird structure, right? Because for the, for the last two, there are distinct grantor's interests, right? The possibility of reverter and the right of entry are different from each other in some important ways. Right? But both of them correspond to the executory interest. Right? Then that side collapses. That is, you could take that line out of the chart where you've written executory interest twice. There doesn't need to be a line there. It's an executory interest either way. Versus up at the life estate where the grantor has exactly one interest, the interest called the reversion. But what the third party could have is the entire class of remainders. The indefeasibly vested remainder, the vested remainder subject to total divestment, the vested remainder subject to open, right? Or the vested remainder subject to partial divestment, the class gift, right? So there are actually four different remainders that are future interest in the third party following the life estate, but only one that follows either of the limited fees. Right, so you want to make sure you get how these connect to each other and can recognize them. Yeah. Yep. Yep. No, the possibility, I mean, if there are a couple different things in there to which you are alluding. The, when the terminating condition happens in the determinable estate, right, title passes back to the grantor automatically. The grantor doesn't have to do anything. The right of entry has to be exercised. That is most significant, and I think it's very unlikely to show up on the MBE. Um, I suppose it's possible. It's most significant in its relationship to adverse possession because the clock is actually running against the grantor who holds the, pow the possibility of reverter because title is now in the grantor. And so if the prior estate holder stays on the land, they are holding adversely, whereas in the right of entry case, until it is exercised, they are not holding adversely and the, pow the, the statute of limitations is not running in favor of the possessor. It's kind of, it's kind of a paradox in a way. So for, in that situation, it's significant, not for, not for too many others. So on the very next page, we come to our statement of the rule. And there are a few, there are a few little comments that I want to make to this page on page 56. 
I think there's a better way to, to say what is said at the end of the second paragraph here, where it says that the rule against perpetuities limits the kinds of conditions you can put on the transfer of an interest in property. I think that's not quite the right way to put it. It's not so much a limitation on the kind of condition. What it is a limitation on is how long it can remain undetermined whether someone's interest is going to come in. Right? It is a durational limit on a period of uncertainty. It's allowed to be uncertain who is coming in and is going to share Blackacre for some period of time. That period is the perpetuities period. The rule against perpetuities is a rule against interests remaining uncertain too long. Yes, if you know enough to know what remoteness investing actually means. Because remoteness investing is not remoteness of vesting in possession, it's only remoteness of vesting in ownership. And remoteness of vesting in ownership, or the notion of vesting in ownership, has to do with when all contingencies upon someone's future possession are conclusively resolved. Right? When the contingencies are resolved, not when they come in. They can come in remotely. It's the contingencies that cannot wait for the remote time for their resolution. For their resolution. And that is, in some ways, a fine distinction. And you have to understand what vesting, you have to really get what vesting means in order for uh, thinking of it as a rule against remoteness investing to be useful as opposed to being just another definition that doesn't do you any good. So moving on from there, I think, I, again, I would also quibble a little bit with this next heading. This heading says, interest not subject to the wrap. I would amend that to say interest that never violate the wrap, the rule against perpetuities or the rule, as I usually refer to it. All future interests are subject to the rule, but some never violate it. Right? The grantor's retained interests never violate the rule. The indefeasibly vested remainder never violates the rule. The vested remainder subject to total divestment never violates the rule. But the rule itself applies to all future interests by its own terms, and I don't think it should be limited more than it's already limited. It's limited and complicated enough as it is. I want to clarify on the next page, in our shaded box, it says if the interest is void, it is treated as if it was never there to begin with, which is true from the point of view of the person who has been given an interest that violates the rule. As a practical matter, though, if you're analyzing a conveyance, you want to think of yourself as striking it from the conveyance so that you will properly analyze what arises in its place. Because every time you take an interest out, something must arise in its place. Either a new interest in the grantor or an enlarged prior interest, depending on what happens when you strike the condition. Right? So treat it as if it was never there is a little ambiguous as to what that means for the other interest holders and the grantor. So stricken from the conveyance is sort of the technical thing. If the interest is void, it is stricken from the conveyance. And that is from the moment the conveyance is made, when the deed is executed or when the will takes effect if it's testamentary. So whether we think of these as magic words, they're really just highly technical terms, what it means for an interest to vest, actually there are two different things and you want to distinguish them. Vesting in interest versus vesting in possession. An interest vests in interest or in ownership when all contingencies relating to the interest have been resolved. The interest vests in possession when it becomes possessory. Now that may happen at the exact same moment in time. But it may not. And that's why you need to understand the difference between them. And if we consider, if we turn our minds back to our first conveyance, to A for life, then to B, we realize that at the moment that conveyance was made, right, that is if it appeared in the will at the death of the testator, if it appeared in the deed, when the deed was executed and delivered, there are no contingencies relating to B's possession. 
right? That is, B doesn't know when he's coming in, because we don't know when A is going to die. But we do know whether A is going to die. A is going to die. There are no contingencies relating to B's possession. And so, B is indefeasibly vested. It has the indefeasibly vested remainder, which cannot possibly violate the rule, because how could it? The fact that A may live another 80 years is not the issue. The question is not when will B take possession. The question is when will all contingencies related to B's possession be resolved? And there never were any. They were all resolved at the moment the, con the conveyance was made. Right? And so the interest is not at risk under the rule. Right? So you want to be separating always the resolution of any contingencies related to someone taking possession from the person taking possession, which can, of course, be quite delayed. Right? The life estate holder could be a baby who lives to be 100, et cetera. Right? It can be quite distant. Not remote in the technical sense, but distant. Yes, coming into possession. Right? When the interest becomes possessory, the person vests in possession. And that's why the present interest, which is always possessory, never violates the rule, because it vests in possession immediately. Right? And so obviously, there are no conditions on it, because the person is in possession right now. Correct, and that may be at conveyance. That may be when the conveyance is made, right? To A for life and then to B is placing no conditions on anybody. Not on A and not on B. Okay, so when it's served, that's when it's vested. That's when it's vested in interest. But B's interest will not vest in possession until A dies. Right? B owns the remainder the whole time, but it doesn't vest in possession until A dies. The life in being is a person we can use to measure the perpetuities period, right? It's part of, obviously, the words of the rule, because it remoteness is defined as more than 21 years after the death of, and really, it's better to understand it as every life and being when the conveyance was made, rather than some, which leads to problems in analysis. But we're not going to do very complex perpetuities analysis. Don't need to worry about it too much. The main thing to be keeping your eye on is what is the last moment in time that, at which all contingencies will be resolved? All right, so if it's to A for life, then to B's first child. B is childless at conveyance, to take a simple example. A for life, then to B's first child. B is childless at conveyance. Notice B is not getting anything in this gift. We're using B to identify a taker, but B is not a taker. To A for life. Then to B's first child. B is childless at conveyance. What does B's first child have? What is the name of the interest that B's first child has? To A for life, then to B's first child. B's first child, they cannot be vested because they all the person has to do is get themselves born the first child of B. It's a weird way of putting it, but it's the right way of putting it. Non-existent people can own stuff. But it's subject typically to the contingency of their being born, being born into a class, being born the child of so-and-so. Right, so B's first child has a contingent remainder. That's the classificatory task. Then there's the rule against perpetuities task. Is this contingent remainder valid? How long is the longest we will have to wait to find out whether there is a person in the world who is B's first child? The life of B. The life of B. B is a life in being at the conveyance, and so the interest doesn't violate the rule. Even if we have to wait 90 years because B is a baby right now. Right? Now, if B is a baby right now, right, there may be a gap between the death of A and the birth of B's first child. And if we're classifying in a very complete and sophisticated way, we have to classify for that gap, and we have to classify for what happens if B never has a child. That is, we classify for B's child born during the life of A, B's child born during after the, after the death of A, and never. Right, so we have grantors retained interest that will be filling in that gap, but the MBE doesn't even ask you to do something that hard, right? It would ask you to classify for B's first child and expect you to be able to do it the right way. It would not ask you to fill in the grantors retained interests, which are a reversion in fee simple subject to an executory interest. Um, because that's the way to capture it. And then if B dies, 
the reversion becomes a reversion in fee simple absolute because we know conclusively that the child will never be born. Right? So one can do that. The MBE is not going to ask you to classify a reversion that complicated. They're just not. They're much likelier to ask you to classify something, to classify or apply the rule to an interest like to A for life than to B's first child, telling you B is childless at conveyance. So that level of classification and app application of the rule, you need to have. Beyond that, no, not for the MBA. It's going to vest much sooner than that. It's going to vest during the life of B or never, and B is alive. We never even use the 21 years. Correct, correct, because it's measured by the life of B. All right, onward. Um, I think we're not going to, we've done it, right? And that's, I recommend that people work through this, but we have done a problem sufficiently similar to it that I think we're okay. If questions arise, feel free to email me. All right, number three, page 59. Okay, so this is, again, if we were to frame this the way that it would be today, the question would say, is the conveyance, the gift, the transfer, the limitation in favor of Farley valid under the rule? Is it? Yes. Because? Because it's certain uh, to happen within that 30 year period. Uh, it's certain to happen within the life of the all three lives of the uh, Which one specifically? Whose life and death is crucial to determining whether this interest comes in? Farley. It's Farley who matters here. Nobody else. Right? This is going to happen in Farley's life or never, because either 30 years from now, Farley, if Farley dies between now and 30 years from now, the interest is destroyed. If Farley is alive 30 years from now, the interest comes in. Farley is alive now, Farley is a life and being. That's the, those are the words we look for. So where is the answer, where is our, which is the right answer? Right. It's ridiculously easy. This is so much easier than what we just did when you look at these answers, right? Farley's interest can't be a reversion. A reversion is a grantor's interest only, right? Vested subject to divestment, not Farley. It's the other guy who's vested subject to divestment. Right? If you can classify in a rudimentary way, you will miss no questions on the MBE in this area. They're not hard. Right? They're not asking you this tricky stuff, like what is the grantor's retained interest? And you know, They're not doing that. Right? They're just asking whether you know these vocabulary words and can classify in a rudimentary way. Also, by the way, 30 years is a trick number that they use to make you think that the interest is going to violate because everyone thinks 30 is longer than 21. It must be invalid. Don't be fooled. So I have a general in some materials I've prepared that my students have, my rap danger signs. And one of them is a period of years greater than 21 years. But by the same token, don't be fooled. All right. All right. All right. Again, we're going to talk through enough of this so you can read this material. I'll just annotate as we go because I have my own way of teaching it, and it, they're, they're consistent but slightly different. What, I, what, what is described here on page 60 as purpose limitations, that's really what I'm calling true conditions. Right? These are the cutoffs. This, but if it's used as a tavern, right? So the way that I define these is as the condition that may happen tomorrow or never. When you're reading, think, is this a condition that may happen tomorrow or never, right? The land being used as a tavern, that could happen tomorrow or never. The B using the, the land as a tavern, that's a condition that has to happen during the life of B. Right? We're going to know, right? By the time B is dead, we're going to know for sure whether that condition was fulfilled or not, right? We're not going to be waiting some indeterminate period. So that would be another way to put it, a condition that could happen at any time. 
right? Is B using the land as a tavern, a condition that could happen at any time? No, it could happen during the life of B at any time, but not after the death of B, right? So if we can know when is the last moment at which the condition can occur or conclusively fail to occur, it's not gonna be the problematic kind of condition. But also keep in mind, it's implicit in what I've said, and if you work through this material again, you will see it. The rule against perpetuities is concerned with remote vesting conditions, not with remote divesting conditions, right? So to be, but if the land is ever used as a tavern, to see, that does not create any problems for B. It creates problems for C, right? B's interest is perfectly valid, even subject to its remote divesting condition. It's C's interest that is in trouble. So typically what will happen is that C's interest will be removed and a grantor's interest will arise in its place because all grantor's interests are vested as a rule of law, even though as you can see, to say, to be. But if the land is ever used as a tavern back to the grantor, that's a remote interest, right? Because it's subject to a true condition that might happen tomorrow or never. And you say, but then isn't the grantor's interest subject to remote vesting? Answer, no, because grantor's interests are just defined as vested. That's it. If it's a grantor's retained interest, it's defined as vested, even when it is subject to a remote condition that might happen tomorrow or never. Don't be distracted. Classify first, then apply the rule. Because if you have classified properly, you will never be misled into thinking that a grantor's interest is potentially in violation of the rule, because you will know reversions, possibilities of reverter and rights of entry never violate the rule. Just by definition, all grantor's interests are safe. All right. Well, yes, except that to be, but if the land is ever used as a tavern back to the grantor, we cannot actually answer with certainty whether the grantor is ever coming in. It's remote, right? That is, it could be in 200 years the land is used as a tavern and it goes to the grantor's heirs. That's remote, but we don't care. The rule allows it, right? That is, it, classify first and then make sure you're applying the rule only to the interests that are vulnerable under the rule, okay? Page 61 takes us through some tricky situations that sometimes come up, and so I'm going, I want us to go through it, and I'm gonna, I've got some annotations to add because I teach this area a lot. So we want to be aware of it. The afterborn child. Uh, notice the afterborn child is to be distinguished from the afterconceived child. The common law is very familiar with the afterborn child because people died constantly leaving behind pregnant wives. That situation is well known. Soldiers, sailors, disease, a duel, whatever it is, people were dying constantly leaving behind pregnant wives. If that pregnant wife gives birth to a live child, that child participates on a footing with his and her brothers and sisters, if any. If this is the first child, that man does not die without an heir, even though we have to wait, right? We have a gap, but we ignore it, right? And if that child is later born alive, that child is treated as having been in being the whole time. If the child is not born alive, the child is treated as if they never existed, and then that man dies childless or the estate is divided among the siblings, et cetera. But the idea that someone may be born later but still participate, that little bit of time travel, common law is totally familiar with it, right? Assisted reproductive technology changes that in no way except for the after-conceived. The after-conceived raise a whole host of problems, but the after-born do not, right? People do being born after the death of the ancestor under whom they claim, not a problem. All right, so don't worry about that. So here we have our example. A devises black acre to his children equal shares. When A dies, he has two children, X and Y, and his wife is pregnant with a third child, Z, who was born one month after A's death. All right? Does Z own a part? Yes, a third. They all participate on an equal footing. Don't worry about, but who's running black acre while the pregnancy is going on? Don't worry about it. All right? We're keeping track of the accounts. If Z gets born alive, Z's entitled to a third. If he doesn't, he isn't, and that's it. Common law's worked it out. Age contingency beyond 21 in an open class. And that relates us to some, it relates to some other class gift rules that we want to be aware of. To A for life, then to A's children. That's perfectly okay, always. 
because the class of ACE children will close when? Because when is the last moment that we will figure out and be able definitively to answer the question, who are A's children? A dies plus a period of gestation if necessary. So when you think about the perpetuities period, it's often taught as lives and being plus 21 years plus a period of gestation if necessary. It has those three components, but the third one comes after the second one. Now in our case, because of this, we don't need the 21 years, we just need the period of gestation if necessary, right? So someone leaving behind a pregnant wife makes it necessary. So that's no problem. Age contingencies up to 21 years, also okay. Because then it's lives and being, plus 21 years. And by the way, plus a period of gestation if necessary, right? So if A's children have to reach 21, but Z is in utero, you might say, and be overthinking it, Z isn't going to reach 21. Yes, he is, because he gets a period of gestation if necessary. Right? Lives and being, plus 21 years, plus a period of gestation if necessary. That's okay. Right? So A leaving behind a pregnant wife, no problem, still to A for life, then to A's children who reach 21, perfectly okay. But if it's longer than that, then it's invalid. Then the class gift is invalid. And you want to remember that the rule for class gifts, there are many, many slogans in this area, and I'll only give you a few of them. The relevant one here, which you should put next to age contingency beyond 21 in open class, is bad as to one, bad as to all. In other words, the entire class gift is invalid. It's not just that it's invalid for Z, the one who won't get there in time. Bad as to one, bad as to all. Right? So if this conveyance is made in a will, right, to, A's ch to A for life, then to A's children who reach 30, and A already has two children over 30, it does not matter. Right? That gift is invalid, and it is completely invalid. Bad as to one, A's non-existent child who he's never even going to have, bad as to all, his two existing children who have already met the age contingency. Bad as to one, bad as to all. Right, so if a class gift includes a contingency that can even possibly make it invalid for one class member, the entire class gift is stricken. We do not save it for the ones who've already met the contingency. We don't save it for the ones who are certain to meet the contingency in time, for example, because they are already lives and being and can be their own measuring lives. Right? If it's bad as to one, it's bad as to all. That's the hard part of applying it, right? is seeing and remembering bad as to one, bad as to all. The whole class gift goes out, right? Yep, and then the grantor's reversion would arise. Okay. Uh, and now the fertile octogenarian. I will also, uh, you know, annotate. Property law is impervious to the facts of life. Well, yes and no. It presumes that every living woman, no matter how old, is capable of bearing a child. I would not put it that way. I would put it this way. It, and, but it irrebuttably presumes. Right? It irrebuttably presumes that every living person, no matter how old, is capable of bearing or adopting a child. And that helps to make it seem less ridiculous. Because, in fact, every living person is capable of bearing or, as the case may be, adopting a child. Thus, the vested remainder in a woman's children is still open until her death. Right? Evidence of infertility is completely, right, not to the point. So I, when I teach this, I usually teach it in the way that I described it before. The irrebuttable presumption of lifetime fertility applies to everybody. The unborn widow or widower, we'll see if we have an example of such a question that will force us to go through it because it's potentially complicated. Our example here is to my son for his life, then to his widow for her life, then to their surviving children. So let's analyze these interests one at a time. To my son for his life, life estate, valid, invalid. Valid, it's present and possessory, can never violate the rule. Then to his widow for her life, what does she have? Classify for the widow. We will get there. We will classify before we apply the rule. She does not have a reversion. She is not the grantor. What kind of remainder? Yes, a contingent remainder. 
It is a contingent remainder in life estate. You absolutely can do that. What something is a future interest in is different from what future interest it is. You absolutely can have a remainder in life estate. And you see it is actually subject to a dual, well, one contingency framed one way, two contingencies framed another. The son must marry and his widow must survive him, or his wife must survive him. Another way to put it is there has to be a widow. But being a widow has two meanings. It has two components. You have to be married to the decedent and outlive him. That's what it means to be a widow. So there has to be a widow, not a wife, because he could be married but outlive his wife. right? So a widow, specifically, that is a surviving spouse. Is the surviving spouse's interest valid or invalid under the rule? Why? Explain. That's not a problem. Then he dies and no one gets the interest and he's a life and being and that's no problem. It's important to remember that an interest being invalid is not the same thing as the interest failing. The interest can fail because there's no one to take it, but that doesn't make it invalid. An interest that fails is one where we wait and there's nobody and okay, there's nobody. That's different than an interest being invalid from the moment it was created because, it, because of the possibility of remote vesting. That's our question. Is there a possibility of remote vesting? Another way of, answering that, of asking that question is, what is the last moment in time at which we will conclusively know whether he has a widow. It's also the first moment in time. There's only one moment in time. When is that moment? When he dies. He is a life and being when this interest is created. And so, she's not a life and being, but who cares? We're not measuring by her, we're measuring by him. And so, it is valid. It is indeed valid. And this illuminates the important part of the unborn widow rule, which is it is not typically the unborn widow's interest that is invalid. It is the one that follows it. Not the widow's own interest, but the one that follows it. Because the widow of a living person will always be determined conclusively at the death of that person, who is a life in being. That's different than to A's first child, to the first child's widow, right? If it's the widow of an identified person who's a life in being, it can never be invalid. Not her interest, but potentially the one that follows it, right? And that's what we get here, right? Then to their surviving children. Now you might think, won't the class of their children also close at the son's death? And it will, right? The class of their children will close at his death. But the contingency is, will they outlive their mother? And that is a contingency that cannot conclusively be resolved within 21 years of the death of every person alive at the conveyance. Right? Imagine that the son is now a child. Five years from now, the woman he is ultimately going to marry is born. Right? 20 years pass. They get married. He dies. She outlives him, right? But now the perpetuities period is running because she wasn't in being when that conveyance was made. She's afterborn, the afterborn widow, right? Now we are in the situation, which I describe as the survivorship contest. Who's going to live longer between the afterborn widow and their children? All of those being people born after the conveyance was made. So the, purpose of the perpetuities period is running. Can we be sure that the survivorship contest will be resolved within 21 years? We cannot. That's the question. How much after the death of her husband will the widow live? We have no idea. It could be five years, but it could be 50 years. She is certain to die, right? It's not about that. She only has a life estate, right? It's about when we will conclusively resolve the survivorship contest, and that is something we cannot be sure we will be able to do within 21 years of some life and being when the conveyance was made because it's the son who's the measuring life, not the widow. That's the afterborn widow problem, right? But the rough and ready version is worry about the next interest, 
not the widow's interest, because the spouse of a living person, whether there is such a person, will always be conclusively determined at the death of that person. It's interests that follow it that are potentially jeopardized. That's the crucial thing. Okay? Yes. Yes. A widow, right? A widow is the surviving spouse, the female surviving spouse of a person. Okay? All right. On to page 62, which is not a rule against perpetuities question, but moves us on to a different area that has to do with limitations on conveyance. Number four. You should be so lucky as to get a question this easy on the MBA. Okay? This is just about understanding, first of all, what a sublease is, what an assignment is, and what the rule is about the relationship between them. What is the difference between a sublease and an assignment? Right. There are a few other wrinkles, right, but that's right, and it also has the world's easiest mnemonic. Again, no one should miss questions in this area, really. Not ever at the level of complexity that they're examined. It's almost, it's almost too easy. All right. A sublease involves transferring some of your interest. An assignment is transferring all of your interest. It really cannot be any easier. There's no reason ever to mix them up, right? The words alone are not going to help you. It's not obvious which one would be all, but this, some all, right? You'll never <laughs> mix it up again. And then the rule, right? So there's a rule about this, right? Does a prohibition on subleases all imply a prohibition on assignments? Does it? It does not. They're always read narrowly because they're restraints on alienation. So a, pro a prohibition on sublease doesn't imply a prohibition of assignment. A prohibition of assignment doesn't imply a prohibition on sublease. A prohibition on all transfers is also okay and is enforceable, right? But they're each read narrowly. So if it only prohibits one, there is no prohibition on the other. So can he? Yes. Which is our better answer? Yes. The answers are close in wording, right? But hopefully wouldn't otherwise confuse anybody, right? And then the, the as you see, C and D both turn on failing to understand, this, uh, to understand or know this rule. And by the way, for D, presumptively, every interest is assignable, right? That is, the law presumes free alienation, and so no, no restrictions are read in other than perpetuities, right? But even perpetuities is an affirmative enactment, right? If it weren't for the rule against perpetuities, you could have them, right? So all interests are alienable. Well, yeah. Well, the question is, is it who has to respect it, right? Um, Depending on the terms of the lease, it may be that the landlord can terminate your lease on this basis and then terminate anything that depends on it. So if, if it is a, if, if it is a in violation of the prohibition, yes. Accept it. Yep. Right. Okay, we have a few notes that we want to add to our little chart on page 63. So we understand what this is about. Um, yeah, you can read because we're doing sublease and assignment. Yeah. Right. Right. So the question is if the the Sub lessee, Paul, stops paying rent. Can the landlord still come after Tom? Yes, of course he can. 
right? Because your landlord has not agreed, is not a participant in this, there's no novation, and et cetera, right? So he remains primarily liable, right, even during the term of the sublease. What about in the assignment case? Right, now what, what is different in terms of Tom's continuing liability? Right, he's secondarily liable. So he can't get out completely. There's no getting out completely, right? Not without the agreement because there's still privity of contract between you and your original landlord, right? That's not going away, right? But now he's secondarily liable. Yep. Uh, so when you, when you and I'll say another thing, but go ahead. Um, the, the privity of contract, I get a little confused when there is, okay, so if I, if I assign, like, sort of, uh, you assign. You don't sublet, you assign. Right. I okay. assign uh, privity of a I'm the original landlord. I'm going to, I'm just going to pay you. I'm going to pay you the, uh, the monthly rent. Does she have a privity of contract with the landlord? No, she has privity of estate with me because my retaking possession will happen immediately upon the termination of her possession. That puts us in privity of estate. And, and of course, the issue is not when she does pay me. The issue is when she doesn't pay me, right? Can I sue her directly? If she's your assignee, right, whether she's your assignee or your subtenant, I don't have privity of contract with her. She and I didn't sign anything. The two of you signed something. She and I signed nothing. But if she is the assignee, the legal fiction, if you want to put it that way, is that we are in privity of a state because my possession will immediately follow hers, and that allows me to sue her directly on the rent. If she's your subtenant, she and I have neither privity of, of a state nor privity of contract, and I cannot sue her directly. Oh, okay, so in the first example, that would be your third party. Right, right, okay. right. So there's never uh, privity of contract. Unless there's privity of contract. Unless there's a piece of paper that both of those people have signed, there's no privity of contract between them. Right. Okay? All right. That's our little moment of subletting and assignment, and that's about all there is to it. And now, on to deeds, delivery, and various other consequences. As is noted at the top of page 64, the law governing the transfer of deeds is tested heavily, and that's correct. In order for title to property to be conveyed validly, the deed must be delivered, because this is part of the law of gift. Right? Gift requires donative of intent, delivery, acceptance, where the gift is of value, acceptance can be presumed. That's true, right, for real property. And so, delivery is essential. Whether delivery has occurred depends primarily on the grantor's intent. So, in our shaded area here, the, grant, the grantor delivers the deed at the time that he or she intends to convey an immediate, irrevocable interest to the grantee. While physical transfer of the deed to the grantee creates a presumption that the grantor intended to create an immediate interest in the grantee, and hence is delivery, it is possible to have delivery without physical transfer. In other words, that's not the only way. Right? That is, there can be delivery without physical transfer. For example, the grantee, the gra it should say the grantor, that's a typo, the grantor does not give the deed to the grantee, but sends it to the register of deeds. Right? That also is another way of communicating the irrevocable intent that the transfer be made. And of course, by the same token, the transfer of the deed is not delivery in the absence of that intent. Here, hold on to this, because I'm going to be traveling out of the country, and when I get back, then we will execute it, etc. No delivery. Right? So delivery has both a subjective and an objective component. They have to both be there. Um, what happens if a deed is delivered, never recorded, and subsequently destroyed? Does it count? Yes. Destruction of the deed 
does not cause title to revert. And there are a few different ways of thinking about why that is so. Um, the one that's the way that it's put here is a deed is only evidence of title. And that's, that's right. It's just that the transfer of title is itself a bizarre kind of metaphysical event. This idea that there really does have to be delivery, that's a real requirement. But that the deed itself, the piece of paper, isn't the title, and so tearing up the piece of paper is a, and may create problems of proof, but it has no effect on the title, right? The metaphysical, magical thing that is happening, right? So if I, as the owner of property, give you a deed transferring title to you, and I do so properly, title, right? Think of it as like, you know, like the soul. Title is in you. If you tear up the deed, title has not come back to me because Tearing up a deed is not a way of getting title back to me. There are ways, but that isn't one of them. So now all we've done is create an evidentiary problem. We haven't actually moved the title around. Because moving the title around is not easy to do, right? It has to be done the right way, and nothing will substitute for that, right? So that's what you want to be sort of paying attention to, although it is a weird concept. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Yes, and then someone's adversely possessing against them and all kinds of crazy stuff happens. Right. And then there's also another note, note you want to be aware of on page 64. Once a deed has been delivered and accepted, the original owner has no claim to it. Now, of course, some of those cases may involve some acceptance issues, but acceptance can be presumed. Right? Acceptance is presumed even if the grantee has no knowledge as long as it's a, it's a value. And that's the other thing. And, and really, we could say various things about that policy. If I own Blackacre and it has been used as a site for toxic dumping and the government is about to charge me a million dollars to clean it up, can I just deed it to you and send it to the Register of Deeds and somehow move the liability to you? No, because that is not a situation in which, I mean, even if acceptance is presumed, it can be rebutted by saying, had you only known, you would have refused. But for the average Blackacre, it's a value and acceptance can be presumed because people want stuff, right? So again, it's, there's, it's not, there's, there's nothing subtle about it. Uh, again, once the deed has been delivered and accepted, the original owner has no claim to it, which also means the seller no longer has liability on the contract, if, they, if it's a purchase and sale agreement, and therefore is not obligated to provide anything more than what the deed requires. And that is a doctrine which we will talk about on it's actually here on page 66. So let us actually go to page 66 before we do questions five and six. Uh-huh. Yep. Yeah, but it's, it's delivery to the recorder, right? Delivery to the register of deeds is a prerequisite of the recordation. So if somebody, like, say I, I gave you my house, mm -hmm. I didn't tell you yet, I mm -hmm. recorded it, mm -hmm. I left Well, but the deed, but it, there's something that's already in the recorder's office. Correct. That's I, it. I have to do right. If I didn't record it, and I'm like, okay, I wrote out the deed, I left it by my front door, and I died. That's no delivery. Sorry, there's no delivery. delivery. Even though yeah. I to do no, no, no. Delivery. It's subjective part is met, but the objective part isn't. Okay. There's, delivery has a subjective and an objective component, and they both have to be satisfied. Right. What can satisfy them is sometimes weird, but they both have to be satisfied. All right, so look at puts pages 64 and 66 together because they really do go together and then we'll do the questions. This point that's made at the bottom of page 64, the seller no longer has liability on the contract, which there are a couple things to say about that, right? So imagine we're in the purchase and sale situation. The seller no longer has liability on the contract because the seller now is the grantor who has liability on the covenants of title in the deed. It's not like it just disappears. It's that we now have deed covenants instead of contract obligations. Right? And that's what puts us into what's on page 66, which is not quite the way I would put it. The deed kills the contract. The technical, traditional way to express this is the contract merges into the deed. Right? The contract merges into the deed. And that means to the extent they are incompatible, the deed governs. 
but they shouldn't be incompatible. They should be the same thing, right? But once there has been a deed delivery, there is now no contract. The contract merges or has been absorbed into the deed. So we'll look at the example here and then we'll go to the questions. Any buyer contracts to purchase a house from Sly Seller who contracts to provide good and marketable title, about which we may say more. However, the deed that Sly delivers and that Benny accepts contains no covenants of title, right? So good and marketable title has a technical meaning. No covenants of title is the quit claim deed that basically is claiming, well, good and marketable title is at minimum a claim. I have title, I have the right to convey it to you, I'm conveying it to you. No covenants of title is whatever I have, which might be nothing you have. Now, there are reasons why a quit claim deed is, can be desirable. It's just important to understand what it is, right? What a quit claim deed is, is the seller saying, whatever it is that I have, which might turn out to be nothing, you now have. So those are dramatically different. Good marketable title versus the quit claim, no covenants of title deed. Benny then learns that Sly owed money to several loan sharks and gave them liens on the property to secure the loans. Um, Benny sues Schuyler for breach of contract to provide marketable title. Right? Does he win? No, he doesn't. Because when he accepted the quit claim deed, he accepted the whatever it is I have, you have, he misses his chance, pay attention to the deed you're getting. And as it says in our shaded portion, acceptance of the deed by the buyer discharges the seller's liability on the contract and leaves the buyer with remedies only on the covenants in the deed. So that's the idea. The contract promises give way to deed covenants at delivery, but not before. Right? That's the picture. Right? So if the facts say B accepts the deed, you must eliminate any answer choice that bases, that bases the seller's liability on the contract. Well, there's no contract anymore. All right? once, the deed, once the deed delivery and acceptance is complete, no liability on the contract. Okay? All right, so now let's look at questions five, six, perhaps seven, maybe. Okay. Yep. Yep. I reject it. Right. Well, he would say, deliver me the deed you promised me, or you're in breach of our contract to deliver good and marketable title. Right. Okay, so where's our, our question would be broken out. It's medium length, so read the question, which we're then going to reframe a little bit. Read the, the last sentence of it, yeah. Yeah. Okay, so the question would now be phrased who has title to Brown Acre? It's going to be A or B, right? Who has title to Brown Acre? So now, let us read. <laughs> okay, it's a gift. This is okay, right? That is, there are different, some different rules for purchase and sale than for the gratuitous conveyance, but this is the gift. Okay. okay. By the way, does a deed have to be recorded in order for title to move? No, right? Recordation is about everybody else in the world. It's not about the relationship inter se between grantor and grantee, right? Their relationship is what it is. It may be defeated by other people's superior claim, who don't have the right kind of notice, etc. right? But it is not necessary for title. Think of the little cloud over the, <laughs> over the head of, of the persons of the brown acre. Right? It moves, right? Record it or not. Okay, go on. Right. So that's that situation. I changed my mind, right? Destroy the deed. She does. Right. Ah, well, then this question actually needs a little bit more revision because dead people can't own stuff. Right. So it, it would be who, whose successors will prevail in claiming title to Brown Acre? Whose successors will prevail? Because they're both dead now. But this is just right down the line, the question that we talked about before. So whose successors prevail? 
By the way, also their mother and daughter, they may have the same successors, but try not to be distracted by that. Right, because <laughs> right, it got to her. So now let's look at our two answers, which is the superior one. Right, easy. Easy. If you know the rule, it's easy, right, because C is a bad, bad answer. Right? Okay. All right, number six. Yes, I'm sorry, yes, this is 65A. Okay, so this is the same question. These are all the same, although this is a little bit, which is the best reason, right? If Marsh wins, it'll be because? So that's a little bit of an interesting way the question could be framed because it's not, it's not making Marsh losing one of the possibilities, right? So you might have thought, oh, this is going to be easy. Marsh is going to win, but then it's a harder question, right? Because if he wins, it's because. All right, so it's a little open-ended. Okay. Okay, so now it's going to be like, how is she... How is it going to end up back in her? Right? All right, so this is, in a way, the same question, right? sort of, right? Because we have this death. So, where is title? Why do you think so? Right, acceptance can be presumed, but it's not irrebuttably presumed, right? Here we have evidence to overcome the presumption, and that evidence is him saying, I don't want it, right? So if she wins, what we want to look for is that, right? So now we've got to survey our answers. Where is it? Right, and there it is. All right, so once you're, you know, once you're aware of those elements, it's easy. We can look at the other answers just to eliminate them, but they're bad answers. All right, court will impose a constructive trust to carry out the intent. That would be the wrong, that would go the wrong way, right? So that has no business being there. Presumption of de delivery arising from the recording is not valid unless the grantee has knowledge. Okay, so that's just testing your knowledge of the rule, right? Which is saying, what's the defect? Is the defect that there's no acceptance if he doesn't know, right? Or is the defect that he never accepted? Simon's declaration was a constructive reconveyance, which we know it wasn't. You can only do it the way you can appropriately do it. Okay. There's a note here on meets and bounds descriptions. It is certainly possible that there will be one. That is how specific it has to be, right? And make sure that it's, you know, draw a picture if necessary and other requirements of the deed. Remember, to be valid, the deed must reasonably identify the parties involved and the land in question, must identify the grantee, right, and then has the description, the meets and bounds, which is typical, though it's not the only way to do it. All right, question seven, page 67. Okay, so we've got no idea what's going on, right? So this will be in a, I think the, the question would now be more, would be either who has title, right, in a suit to determine title, who will prevail, something like that. Okay, start and stop. Sue, um, a five acre tract of one, one acre of which had previously been owned by Oak, but to which Sue had acquired title by the which possession. She contracted to convey the full five acre tract All right, so we can stop there before we, just so we can do a little bit of law. Is Sue in a position to convey good and marketable title to the entire parcel? No. Because? Well, we're told in the facts that um, Sue has acquired title by adverse possession. Right, title acquired by adverse possession is not marketable. That's just a rule. All right, what do you have to do? You bring a quiet title action and you clean up the title, right? But good and marketable title 
cannot be acquired. It, well, it wouldn't be right to say good and marketable title cannot be acquired by adverse possession. It can. But title acquired by adverse possession alone is not good and marketable title. Right? That's just a rule. Okay? Go on, so then we'll see what, what's going to happen next. So the qu contract says good and marketable title. Then what? So there it is, right? We start with good and marketable title, we end up with a quit claim deed. Go on. She accepted. She accepted the quit claim deed. Right. Now she tries to quiet title in herself, ends up losing the one acre, turns around, right? Right. That is the prior owner, right, from whom the one acre parcel had purportedly been acquired by adverse possession. But guess what? It wasn't. Right? Okay. Right. Who's going to win? Okay. So let's draw a map and figure it out. Okay. So start at the beginning. Reread the facts. Yes, now as we're going to discover, owned is being used a little loosely here, but whatever. Really, it should say possessed, right? The five-acre track of land. This is Sue. Okay, go on. Okay. Or so she says, right? The question's a little bit weird, right? But that's, so that's why I've drawn, I've drawn it this way. Right, right. Right. Which she cannot give as to this. Okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yep. Right, a quick claim. Right? What Sue says is, whatever I have, you have. Now, we know it's four acres. She thought it was five acres. Okay? Right? Right. right. This is Opal's land. Right? And Opal says, Peg, get off my land. Right? So Opal ejects Peg from this portion. Right saying, you sold me f four acres for the price of five. Who wins? Why do you think so? No, she did not. She promised to convey something she didn't have. She actually conveyed exactly what she had, and the covenant that the contract merges into the deed. The deed that Sue gave Peg said, whatever I have, you have. And Peg accepted that deed. Peg accepted that deed, right? She contracted to sell her five acres, but she agreed to take a deed that only covered four acres. She can't sue her on the contract. And she can't sue her on the deed either because the deed is a quit claim. Okay? So Sue's going to win. Why? As which is our better answer? Well, <laughs> right. But those answers are close, right? The main thing is analyzing correctly. Yes, C is the right answer because the deed doesn't incorporate. That is, that's a misstatement, but it's a small one, right? The deed incorporates the terms of the contract is actually the wrong way around. Right? It's the contract that merges into the deed. It's not that the deed incorporates, but it's, a, it's fine. That is really, you've got to read closely. And that's when we're certainly going to read both of them, and that will help you avoid the mistake, I think. That is, D would be really tempting, but I think if you read C, then you see that it's superior. All right. Onward. Oh, go ahead. Although this was a little adverse possession. 
Yeah, so the, basically the way to get this answer right is you recognize it, it, it was a quit claim deed. Yep. And so Nobody wins suing on a quit claim deed because a quit claim deed can give you nothing. Right? right? That it's, if you really keep vividly before the, your mind that what a quit, quit claim deed means is all that I have, even if it's nothing, is now yours. You know, then it's obvious you can't sue on a quit claim deed. The main thing that a quit claim deed does, if you're wondering, again, we won't talk too much about its role in real estate planning, that why would you ever get a quit claim deed? You get a quit claim deed to prevent the grantor of that deed from suing you later. Right? If Sue had gotten a quit claim deed from Opal, we wouldn't be in this situation because what Opal would have done in giving her quit claim deed to Sue was give up her future right to evict Peg. And that's why you get a quit claim deed. Not because you think the person really has something. That is, you think you've obtained title by adverse possession. You have two choices. You can bring a quiet title action, which is going to cost X dollars, or you may be able to get a quit claim deed for half of X dollars. Why not just get the quit claim deed? Because now Opal, the Opals of the world, will never be suing your grantee. You still are going to have to quiet title ultimately, but now she can't fight you because she's given you a quit claim deed. That's the, that's the benefit. So, it's all, so since it would be better for Sue to get the quit claim deed. Yes. Um, because yes. instead of spending more money and trying to. Uh, well, you just have to evaluate it under the terms of the particular situation. Is it, will it be cheaper to bring a quiet title? Are we so sure we're going to win and win easily that we can just bring the quiet title action and do it all at once? Or. Are they going to fight us tooth and nail but be willing to accept some deeply below market price for the property because they don't want to take the risk of losing, right? Let's say the market value of that parcel is $1,000. Well, if they have to fight you and they lose, they have spent money and they've lost it. If you just offer them 500 bucks, right, that may offset the risk of losing, be cheaper for you, cheaper for them, et cetera. And so it all depends on the, on the particular fact. You still can't convey good and marketable title, but you will avoid this outcome, right? Okay. Requirements for adverse possession and easements by prescription. So they are very similar. Adverse possession gives you title. The easement by prescription does not. But other than that, they're very similar, right? One is ownership, one is a use right. And their requirements are pretty similar. And you, you do need to be able to recognize when it's one of them and when it's the other, but typically not by very fine-grained distinctions in the requirements, but more what's going on here. That is, is there a transfer of title or is there a transfer of a permanent use right without title? Right there, which is just basically understanding what an easement is, right? And then what a prescriptive easement is, meaning that you can acquire the right to use the land of another in the same way, roughly speaking, as you can actually acquire the land of another by the adverse possession means. So, the requirements for adverse possession, I guess we have, you have initials there that we will fill in, but again, you don't have to be too beholden to any particular way of exactly framing it. So the first is exclusive, adverse possession, the adverse possessor must use the property exclusively and especially, again, you can note this wherever, I'm not so concerned about the initials, it must be exclusive of the true owner. This is very important because the easement by prescription does not require it. So the easement by prescription, that A, I think, is for actual use. But the important thing is not necessarily <laughs> exclusive of the true owner. So you could acquire an easement by prescription to a shared driveway by using it when the true owner is also using it. But you can never acquire title by adverse possession to property that you are using, that you're on, while the true owner is also on it. Now you're basically sort of their licensee, whether they know it. You could, you're a trespasser, sort of licensee, maybe, if they know you're there, but you're never going to gain title that way. Whereas you can actually acquire an easement by prescription through a shared use with the true owner. In other words, the true owner's fail, failure to exclude you from the use may result in the prescriptive easement arising in you. But it will never create adverse possession in you because as long as they are permitting you to use it, your use is permissive and not hostile, as we will see in a moment. All right, requirement three. Number two, it's the same in both cases. 
I usually say that it must be open and notorious, but no, notorious and open is just as good. They actually are two requirements, although people often think of them as one requirement. What's the difference between open and notorious? Um, open means it's not a secret. Right? You're not sneaking on by dark of night and sneaking off in the morning every day for five years. No. Right? It has to be open. And notorious means it must be known to a reasonable true owner. So the true owner who is paying no attention will not be able to use that in their own defense. Be known to a true owner. So hostile, which also appears on both of these and, and means the same thing in both contexts, subject to the difference between title and a use right. One of the ways that I talk about this, again, when I teach the, the course more in its entirety, sort of what's important to understand and to not misunderstand about the requirement of hostility, it is not about the mood or the tone of the relationship between the adverse possessor and the true owner or the prescripti prescriptive easement acquirer and the true owner. The hostility, right, is to the title existing in the true owner. So when you trespass on someone's land and use it as your own, you may like the true owner. Your hostility is not to the true owner. What you are being hostile to is their title and its right to exclude you. Right? What you are doing is insulting the right of their title to exclude you by being a trespasser. Says, I'm using your backyard if I want to use your backyard. The hostility is to the title. And the same goes with the easement by prescription. The hostility that is being expressed in using someone else's driveway is not to the person. It's to that person's right to exclude you. That's what you are sort of denying or insulting or derogating from. Right? That's the notion of hostility. Now, the issue that sometimes arises in both of these cases is hostile as opposed to permissive. If the true owner is permitting you to be there, you will never acquire title because it's permissive, not hostile, to their title. Again, it's not to the owner. It's not about whether you're all friends. It's that one of the things an owner has the right to do is permit others to come on. And so if they are permitting you, your being there is not hostile to their title, but is actually in recognition of their title and their ability to invite you. Right? So you think so being an owner means having the power to invite. If they invite you and you accept the invitation, that is inherently not hostile to the title. It has nothing to do with whether you're friends or not. Right? It's about the superiority of their claim, which gives them the right to invite and puts you in the position of having to accept an invitation as opposed to the brazen trespasser, et cetera. Adverse possession requires that the possession be uninterrupted. That does not mean you can never leave the premises for one second. It means you use it as a true owner would. Uninterrupted in the way a true owner would use it. And the same for the easement by prescription. It must be continuous. But often you will see that on the other side, that adverse possession will be uninterrupted and continuous for the statutory period. In either case, the idea is you are using it the way a person who had a legitimate right to use it would use it. And that's, again, you're not sneaking on by dark of night. You're not covering up all signs of your use. You're using it like an owner would use it. And that means, on the adverse possession side, if it's a summer cabin, using it every summer is enough. You don't have to be there in the winter if a true owner wouldn't be there in the winter. Same thing with the driveway. Do you have to use the driveway every day? You do not have to use it every day. You use it as a true owner would. If you only use it when the true owner is on vacation, not open and notorious, right? That will not qualify. Right? All right. There's another little rule about, I mean, I don't know if we have a, a true adverse possession question other than the one we just did. So now we're actually moving on. This is really short. Yes, California is, in that sense, friendly to the adverse possessor. Uh, but California also requires that adverse possessors pay the taxes, and that's not so easy to do. It's hard to pay someone else's taxes. It's not so, it's not so simple, actually. And so 
the period is short, which favors the adverse possessor, possessor, but we have the tax requirement, which is hard on the adverse possessor, so they kind of balance each other out. Yep. All right, on to question eight, which is on page 69. And again, has some of this contract merges into the deed dimension, right, but with some other little sub rules here. All right, so read just the question and then we'll go from the facts. And I'll just, because I want to make a couple comments about it. Right, which tells us nothing at all, right? If that was all you read, you wouldn't even know this was a property question, right? So we're going to have to take it from the top. This is going to have to do with marketable title, as we'll see, but I'll comment as we go. Right, so it's not going to pass encumbered. That is, he can free it from the mortgage. Breyer refused Fenner's proposal. Fenner began to uh, appropriate legal action against Breyer for specific performance. There is no applicable statute in the jurisdiction where Green Acre is located. All right, so who is going to win? Then we'll think about the best, the, the best legal argument in support of the claim. Right? Do you think Fenner is going to win? Yes. Okay, explain. we're at the closing, right? right? And there's still a mortgage on the land. Right. It's encumbered at the time of closing. Can Venner still force the transaction? And notice our question actually doesn't ask us if he's going to win. It just asks what, his, asks what his best argument is. But if he's going to win, right, which maybe he won't, what would be his best argument? Well, that the balance due on the mortgage was substantially less. Well, right, he can, he can clear it, right? He can and will clear it. It's going to be in that vein. So now let's read through the answers. Uh, a is, as a seller of real estate, he had an implied right to use the contract for the year title be conveyed. Okay, maybe. Right, that's what we were just talking about. So let's see if there's a better answer, because again, when, we, when it's not a yes or no question, we don't necessarily know when, we, when to stop. Okay. B, the lien of the mortgage shifts from Green Acre to the contract proceeds. No, not how mortgages work. <laughs> That's not what equitable conversion is all about. Equitable conversion is about destruction of the property, etc. Right. And D, no provision of the contract has been breached by them. And that's actually false, right? That is, he promised a quality of title he is not yet in the position to deliver. And so? Right. And again, as it's noted, a related doctrine provides for a situation where the grantor claims to have good title but doesn't actually have it at the time of the transfer. The doctrine provides that if the grantor acquires it at a later time, it's automatically transferred to the grantee, and the grantor is stopped from later denying the effectiveness of the deed. This is the doctrine called estoppel, estoppel by deed, right? So that's the other way, right? This, that would be this question, but it's the other way. It's now the vendor who refuses to go through with it. The buyer shows up ready to go through with it, and the vendor says, oh, no, 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 I don't actually have good title after all. Then acquires good title, right? That won't work either. All right, onward to a variety of frequently tested issues, apparently, leading to, relating to multiple lots, which is going to have easements and covenants and relationships between neighbors and so on. Okay. Um, our shaded portion is worth attending to, even if the covenant is not contained in some of the deeds, as long as it is in the public records in the chain of title, subsequent purchasers are subject to it, which is to say also on notice of it. 
Okay, and then we'll, we'll look at the actual issues, I think, as they, as they arise. So question nine. All right, so that's not going to help us, right? <laughs> We've got no idea who's suing who or for what, so we'll take it from the top. Right, blah, 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 right. We're now like being dragged into a bunch of details that we don't need. So just for reading this from the top, right, once you've got a subdivision, chances are you're going to be in the easements, covenants, and servitudes area, and the issue is going to be who's on notice of what, and are people taking subject to notice, are people taking subject to covenants and restrictions not contained in their own deed, but part of the subdivision plat? Are they? part of the subdivision plan? Does it have to also be in your own deed? It doesn't have to be. So that's what we want to be aware of. So let's keep rolling along, but again, you're going to really be skimming. You're not going to be worried about tax savings and the school and who cares. So her deed has this particular restriction. So maybe the question's going in a completely different direction. Okay, go on. Right, so 50 with, 40 without. Go on. Okay. Okay. And now, the next question comes out of the same fact pattern and has to do with this dedication thing. So these would be different sorts of questions. The question would be consolidated. You would not get, you might get some distracting stuff, but not as much as this. You want to take, you take the next one also? Well, wh how are you thinking about the question? Yes. Well, so that's the question. The question is, what is the consequence of it being in that original plan, right? So this is just a little bit, a little rule about dedication to the public, right? So the rule we have, which is set out here, is in a situation where there are lots and a plan is submitted for them, if the plan includes a provision for a future use such as a public school, such a provision is considered an offer of dedication that may be accepted at a later date. So the future purchaser may be in for a rude awakening if the offer is accepted after he or she purchases. Right? That's what's happened here. The school district has accepted the offer, right? and so they win. That's 
That's not why they win. That's like why he loses. Right? Why they win is the other one. If you see what I mean, right? There's dedication and acceptance. Right, he had constructive notice. He took, right, subject to, to notice that there was that dedication. But again, it's a fine distinction. So C would be a correct answer if it said uh, people lose. Because, because, exactly, it's why he loses, not why they win. Right, but it, again, it's a fine distinction. The main thing is understanding that rule, right, that, there, that, that acceptance can follow, and again, this is all in a reasonable time. We're not talking about 50 years later. Well, he is, but arguably he doesn't take uh, without notice. Right? A BFP always takes without notice. Right. It's in the plan. It's in the plan. He, right, yeah, yes. A BFP must take without notice of the prior conveyance or whatever. So he isn't a BFP. Who ta a BFP is one who gives value and takes without notice of the prior or whatever it is. There's constructive notice to the world. To the world, right. It, he, could he could have known. Right, he could have known. If he had checked the plat, he would have seen that there was a dedication. He didn't inquire whether that offer had been accepted. He doesn't have to only ask his grantor, he has to do his research. Okay. Right, right, no, that's right. Okay. All right, some examples and requirements for the creation of easements on page 73, just so you have it. I don't know if we have a lot of other easement questions. We'll see as we go. The express grant of an easement is a transfer to the grantee. The grantee gets the easement. The easement by express reservation, the property is granted out and the grantor retains. I would arrange this table a little bit differently. There are two kinds of easements by implication. One is the easement implied by prior use and the other is the easement implied by necessity. So maybe out to the left you can put implied and then implication by prior use and by necessity. So the easement implied by prior use requires prior use. It's not created at the time of conveyance by prior use. And so generally there will be, um, imagine the driveway situation. It's hard to do these without maps. The sewer is the classic, but the picture of the sewer and the picture of the driveway are the same, right? Here's the house, right? Here's the driveway. Then the owner, this was all one parcel, right? Then the owner conveys this part out, right? This is a situation where the easement would be implied by prior use. The retained easement would be implied by prior use because there's the prior use. Right? That's implied by prior use. Yeah, so that right. Sells right. Where there's the driveway. But there has to have been the driveway. If there was no driveway, there will be no easement implied by prior use. So this is, he's been using the driveway. Then he sells this part. Okay? That's the easement implied by prior use. The easement implied by necessity has only one situation, and that is for ingress and egress. Yes, it must be strictly necessary. So that's someone who owns this, right? Sells this part, this part, this part, and then this part. This parcel will have the easement implied by necessity because otherwise they will be landlocked. Nobody else, just them. Yes. Uh-huh. It's reservation. Yes. Then it's by express reservation and not implication. And they could do that even if you would do it by express reservation if they just were living here, right? 
Some days they went out this way, this way, this way. It's not a driveway, it's a dirt road, whatever it is. But they always have to get out to here. So when they sell this, they then reserve a right to cross at 50 yards south of the northern right. That's by express reservation. And then it doesn't matter whether they were using it before. That doesn't have to be their preferred way of going out. They may never have gone out that way. That's where they want their easement by express reservation. That's fine. Yep. Yep. OK. Yep. And I'll say, easement by prescription, we've done. So that's equivalent to adverse possession. In the very first question we had today, there was a profit. Yes. Um, on the, and then there's an implied easement. Well, not here. Here, it's not implied. Our, in our problem, it says, was granted the right to enter and remove. So that's actually an easement by express grant. It's not implied. That would be, that would be Yes. If there isn't an express easement, there will be an implied easement. But if there's an express easement, there's an express easement, of course, right? Okay, so if there's an, ex right, if there's an express easement to come in from the west side, it's not like you get some implied easement to come in from the east side because that's more convenient to you. You use the easement you got, if you got one. If you didn't get one, then there's an implied easement, and then we can argue about where it should be located and so forth. But if it's actually in the terms, then it's in the terms, and they govern. All right, on to joint interests and question 11. Okay. Who is next? Where do we leave off? Or if we left off with her, we'll skip. So go ahead. Yes. Yeah, we're talking about the same question. Okay. All right, so this is joint tenancy with right of survivorship, and that means what happens at the death of the first? Yeah, yes, it, it's hard to know exactly. You want to understand it as a practical matter. It's worth being precise about it as a technical matter, even though, of course, it's not like you're going to be asked to generate an answer. I think the best way to think about it is that the interest of the deceased tenant is extinguished. Because nothing is transferred. Nothing goes anywhere, right? One interest is extinguished, and the other then expands to fill the available legal space, okay? So it goes to Bob and Bill as joint tenants. Then what? Ah, who owns the land now? Right, it doesn't matter what else he does. So go on reading, but we are remembering Bill owns it. Blah, 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 who cares, right? Because we're keeping track of who owns it. Then number three. And that's fine, he can do that, right? Because Bill owns in fee simple. Once Bob dies, Bill owns in fee simple absolute. And so now, so does Frank in fee simple absolute. And then? And what does he own? He owns everything, right? So Paul owns everything. Now, go on. Yeah, easy. A or B? Yep, easy. That's just like keep track. Keep track of who's doing what. The question's easy. Okay. The forms of ownership. Have you guys been able to fill this in unproblematically? Because we've, there will be some issues of shortness of time. It's a long chapter. So if you have questions about this, 
right? You can give them to me, but this stuff is not hard to find in your materials. I think the unities, right. And what will sever it, right? Conveyance, agreement, simultaneous death, partition, and ways to sever the tenancy by the entirety, divorce, agreement, or execution on the property by a joint creditor. So now you want to be careful and always attentive to when it's a joint tenancy and when it's a tenancy by the entirety, which is the form of joint holding that is only available to persons who are married to each other at the time they take title in that form. Right, because they also have to be married. Okay. All right, so if we jump ahead to the question, we see it's partition. Right, there's going to be, someone is going to be seeking partition. Partition is available for joint tenancy, ordinary joint tenancies, when, approximately, without being hyper-technical. Not for tenancy by the entirety, for ordinary joint tenancy. When is partition as a remedy available? Yeah, they're not getting along, can't manage it, whatever. You try to partition in kind, if you can't partition in kind, then you sell it, split the proceeds. It's available in general as a remedy. Is it available for a tenancy by the entirety. Right. No. Right? So keeping that in mind, let's read. Okay? Okay. Next question. Who was next? Yes. Okay. Right. By the way, just quick, you know, piece of advice. No state currently recognizes common law marriage. That is, as common law marriage entered into today, no state recognizes them. Federal government recognizes them for certain limited purposes, just as the law was changing elsewhere. Forget it. So that's there. I don't know if today the bar examiners would even remind you of that. Okay. Okay. That's bizarre, but whatever. Okay. <laughs> Right, blah, 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 right? We're going to get all these facts that are going to look like common law marriage facts, right? But they were never formally married, right? Then they're going to acquire this property, right? Now come to the end. Just pick up the last sentence or two. Right. Is she going to be able to get it partitioned? Why do you say so? And so she gets her prayer for partition. It's not denied, it's granted. She wants it partitioned on the basis of their contributions, right? And she's going to get it. Right? Not a tenancy by... Now, again, she might turn out, who knows what rights she's going to have, if he's been paying for it, whatever, but they're not asking you to explain the whole thing. They're asking you to recognize that nobody but married couples can create a tenancy by the entirety. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. All right. So the next section has been organized under things where, I mean, in, in the, the view of the people who put these materials together, the common sense or general sense of fairness will go the wrong way. And again, we encountered this when we talked about torts. When is the point at which you want to step back and say, look, is, is that going to be the rule? But in the area of real property, there are probably as many counterintuitive rules as anywhere in the law. There are hyperformal rules that are designed to further policies that people often don't have much of a sense of, particularly lay people. And so we often do get surprising and unpleasant, you know, or, or seemingly unfair results. So the first of these has to do with the enforcement of the statute of frauds in writing. Uh, this, that is the significance that real property transfers must be in writing to be enforceable. There are exceptions, that is, there is a part performance exception to the statute of frauds. One should be aware. It would be going too far to say there are no exceptions. There is a part performance exception to the statute of frauds. But if those part performance factors are not present, ignore all other sympathetic facts, I think is the way to put it. So we'll look at this and then we'll talk about whether the part performance exception um, applies at all. Okay? So this is. Number 12 for all of us. Can an appropriate action to determine the respective interests of sharing this community be a 
all of these Okay, so what we're going to be looking for is Bruce is, or Stanley, Stanley, where is Stanley? Stanley must be a successor to Bruce. I don't know. We'll see. Things are going to happen that are going to suggest somebody else maybe should have some interest in the property, and the question is, are they going to be effective to give it's the son? It's the son. Okay. All right, so let's take it from the top. A brother and sister, Bruce and Sharon, acquired a joint tenancy of 20 acre parcel of land called Dino. They contributed equally to the purchase price seven years later. Ah, and here's a little nuance. Joint tenants is short for joint tenants with right of survivorship. It is not short for all forms of joint tenancy, which we also might think of as including tenancy in common. So joint tenants means joint tenants with right of survivorship. Okay? Okay. Contribute equally to the purchase price. Several, Who cares? Right, go on. Several years later, Bruce proposed that they build an apartment in the They rejected the proposal of the agreed to Bruce that Bruce could go ahead on his own in the north of the house with him, they could share and share to do what she would have to Does this change the ownership structure at all? No, it does not. Right? This is no, there's no oral conveyance that will turn this into a tenancy in common. Correct. You could turn a joint tenancy into a tenancy in common, but not orally. There's no writing. Go on. Bruce proceeded to build an apartment development on the building of the house and approved the new acres. Sharon O'Leary committed his own acres. By the Audubon Society, the acres were tied to the entire state to his son. Right. Who owns Green Acre? Yeah, it's, it's, there's just, it's not even complicated, right? Is, right. So, which, but now it says if she's a judge to be the owner, so they make the question a little harder, right? Because they're going to give you four reasons instead of just two yes questions, right? It's not yes because, yes because, no because, no because. Which is the best answer? Well, I mean, that's true as far as it goes. The question is, is it the best answer? Which is also true, but the question is, is it the best answer, right? It's true he can't unilaterally sever it. No one can. That's true, right? C is irrelevant. Right, you start from there, right? That is, if... A better answer still might have to do with whether the part performance, that no element of the part performance exception to the statute of frauds has occurred, right? Because answer A doesn't even allude to the fact that there is a part performance exception to the statute of frauds, but that's because none of the elements of the part performance exception to the statute of frauds has occurred here, at least not unequivocally, and this is a difficult situation. It's hard to take something out of a joint tenancy with right of survivorship, that is if, if you don't sever one of the unities. Right? And so it would be hard to show even that his conduct only would make sense if there had been a severance. Is that true? Does it get quite to there? It really doesn't, right? Because he's making money out of it. Where it's like he's not doing the sorts of things which only if they had converted it into a tenancy in common could possibly make sense. And that's the stuff that's like part performance exception. Right? That is, people orally agree to convey Blackacre at a set price. Ahead of that, they orally agree, but don't put it in writing. Then the buyer sells their other similar property, moves in and starts improving it, and the seller never says a word. And then when the time comes to present the money, the seller says, no, 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 we don't have a deal. That's the part performance exception to the statute of frauds, when there's conduct inducing reasonable reliance, known to the seller, right, et cetera. Not just doing something to improve it that would be worth a lot more to him if it were a tenancy in common. That's true. That doesn't do it. Because he may still have been gambling on his living longer and his having all of it. Right? We can't, it's not that we can only make sense of his conduct by thinking that there had been a severance. So the answer is A simply because... It is the best answer. Because it had yeah. to Yes. Right. Yes, I mean, there is a part performance exception, but there's nothing here that overcomes it. Okay. 
All right, now we're back to equitable conversion and what it, what it really means, right? Number 13. Yeah. There it is. This is the same question, right? We've seen this. we've seen these facts before, right? Two contractors convey the full five acre, five acre tract of peg, but the contract did not specify the, the quality of the title to convey. Okay, just a little wrinkle on our prior one. Suppose that at the foreclosing, the house on the property had been totally destroyed by fire. All right. Right. All you have to do is look at them. You just have to know what it is, right? Again, you should be so lucky as to get a question that easy. Okay. All right. Onward to recording statutes. Another of those things frequently and heavily tested on the multi-state bar exam in keeping track of who owns what, when, and what the effect of recording is. Right. The effect of the recording acts taken together is both to protect the rights of genuine downstream BFPs and to induce people to record their interests promptly. That's the idea. It's not about the rights as between buyer and seller. It's about creating a public record that will both protect downstream purchasers and will be complete and correct for anybody's purposes. Because failure to record promptly exposes you to the risk of losing the property to a subsequent taker, who is a BFP, for value who takes without notice of the prior conveyance, right? So it's to induce you as grantee to not be tardy in recording the grant that was made to you. The grantor, you don't care, right? You don't have, you've got the money, you don't have Black Acre, what do you care what happens later? You do not care so much. It's as the grantee of Black Acre that you want to make a record of that grant to you so that your unscrupulous grantor can't sell it to somebody else who can then take it out from under you. You would get your money back, but you wouldn't get Black Acre, and you want Black Acre. You want to protect your rights in the property, you will record promptly, and that's what the Recording Act statutes are for. All right? So just so we know, we, sometimes our attention is going to be on the BFP, that is, on the second grantee. Right? A to B, not recorded, A to C, and we're going to be thinking about C's rights. Right? Black Acre, from A to B, no recording. Then, from A to C. In order for C, to enjoy the benefit of the Recording Act in his or her jurisdiction, C must be a BFP, which means a person who takes for value and without notice of the prior conveyance, not a donee, right? not an heir, right? not someone who's just given the property as a gift, and not someone who knows about what happened between A and B. Now, what does it mean to have notice of what happened between A and B? What is it to have notice of the prior conveyance? Well, if it was recorded, you have constructive notice and you'll never be a BFP. If you actually know, because you, C, are A's child and you were in the room when the A to B conveyance happened, right? You actually knew you are not a BFP. And if you have inquiry notice, you are also not a BFP. And that's why I wanted that added to the vocabulary list. What is inquiry notice? Inquiry notice is actual knowledge of facts that would put a reasonable person on notice that there's something going on here, right? So after the A to B conveyance of Blackacre, when you go to visit Blackacre as C, B is living there. That is enough to put you on inquiry notice that perhaps A has sold it to B. Maybe A has only loaned it to B, leased it to B. B is a house sitter whatever, you should now go check the record title to see if there is a conveyance from A to B. Because you are now on inquiry notice that there may have been some agreement between A and B that would mean when you see A, you need to say, yeah, but what about B? Right? So actual notice, constructive notice provided by the record, or inquiry notice, which means actual knowledge of facts that would put a reasonable person on notice that something might be amiss. Okay? All right. Now there are the two different types of recording statutes that you want to be aware of and be able to distinguish from each other, which can be tricky because they sound exactly like each other. 
The pure notice statute, we have the language here, any conveyance of an interest in land, other than a lease for less than a year, because that's an interest not covered by the statute of frauds at all, shall not be valid against any subsequent purchaser for value without notice thereof unless the prior conveyance is recorded. So any conveyance shall not be valid against the subsequent purchaser who takes for value without notice unless the prior conveyance is recorded. And the translation we might offer is the BFP prevails against the prior grantee who did not record. What's significant about this is that the BFP himself need not record. C in our story. Right? So A to B, B doesn't record. A to C, C wins if C is a BFP, even without C recording. In the race notice jurisdiction, C also has to record. Right? So the translation of the race notice statute is that the BFP prevails only if the prior grantee failed to record and the BFP does record. That's the difference. So in a race notice jurisdiction, in order to prevail, the BFP must record. It's not just that the prior one didn't record. Whereas in the pure notice jurisdiction, the BFP is not themselves required to record in order to prevail. So, why are the plurality of jurisdictions race notice jurisdictions? Not just because it's more complicated for law students, but because we want everyone to record. Right? And a pure notice jurisdiction doesn't provide enough incentive for C to record. It gives an incentive to B, but not to C. A race notice jurisdiction forces both of them to record. Well, right, and then C shows up to evict B. That's how this happens. C shows up to evict B, and in a pure notice jurisdiction, C, C says, no, it's not, well, but they're not racing. If they make their, if B records before the conveyance to C, C is on notice of the conveyance to B. And C has nothing to record, right? If B records promptly, C is out of luck, and that's the point, right? But in a pure notice jurisdiction, when C sues to evict B, saying, I'm a BFP who took without notice of the conveyance, and B cannot point to a recordation, then all B can try to do is prove C actually knew or was on inquiry notice. And if C is an out-of-state purchaser or something, B is going to lose and C is going to win. B's failure to record will be fatal. Right? In a race notice jurisdiction, B's failure to record is only fatal if C records, and that's what we actually want. We want everyone recording. Right, so the policies of the recording statutes are best carried out in a race notice jurisdiction. Okay? All right. Number 14. It's complicated. Okay. Right. So who owns it is what we're going to find out. Okay? So we've got to, like, make a list or a chart or something. So go on. Start at the top. All right, so this is O to A, not recorded. So that's vulnerable, right? All right, so this is O to L, recorded. 
Well, the mortgage holder is a BFP. A conveyance has been made. I mean, a mortgage is a conveyance for these purposes, and it has been recorded, right? So notice O has taken a mortgage on property he doesn't own anymore, right? That's kind of the situation. We don't know what's happening next, but okay. Gratuitously. Mm -hmm. Right, but does it matter, right? Because he doesn't own it anymore vis-a-vis, well, we've got A, L, and N, but is N a BFP? No, so the recording statutes are not gonna protect her regardless of her recordation because she is not a BFP, okay? Right, so L recorded first, but A ultimately recorded, okay? Okay, true or false? Okay, so who wins? Okay, which answer is better? Yep. So there's a hard question lurking in there about mortgages, but there's an easy question that's the one you're actually being asked, so be glad. All right. <laughs> All right. Here we've got more sort of chain of title stuff. So next one, it's long. It's long. So let's read and maybe a sentence back from the question. Okay, so this is like a weirdly framed question, right? Or is he getting the injunction or is he not getting the injunction? That's the question. So P wants an injunction against the water district and its proposed entry on his property. So they're gonna have some rights and the question is gonna be, can, do they have these rights? Do they still have them? Do they not have them? Et cetera. Okay, so that's what we're paying attention to, Peterson and the water district, all right? Okay. Right, so this is typical, right? If you're gonna develop something, you're gonna give an easement for power, for water, for light, whatever, right? And then develop, and that easement will be on the land going forward. Which we've seen. Install, respect, repair, maintain pipes. Okay, got the picture? All right, go on. Does that matter? Right. But now we know where this is going, right? They want to come in. Are they going to be able to come in? Yes, so his attempt to get an injunction will, will fail, right? So which is the better answer? Yep, easements don't go away. All right, recorded easements don't go away. So easy. Again, you want, with questions like this, you want to be able to read them quickly and effectively because it's actually not a hard question, right? The crucial stuff is, right, they've got the easement, they recorded it. Pretty much end of story, right? Because he's on notice, it doesn't matter what kind of jurisdiction we're in, nothing else matters. And then you want to check, what do they want to do? Okay, so we'll check, what do they want to do? Excavate the pipe, right? So you want to read with enough care to make sure that they're not coming in to do something completely different. I'm not, we've skipped more than you would skip just because we have shortness of time, but you want to reason that way even if you read with a little bit more care. Okay. There are some negative easements, that is things you can prevent other people from doing. It's another style of easement, right? One style of easement, the affirmative easement, allows someone to enter onto the property to do something. Another style of easement, prevent someone from doing something on their own property that would have an effect on your property. So there are a few such easements, which we have uh, their initials here, 
The first one is the surface, right? The right to the surface is what you have. The next is for support, and the full name is for lateral and subjacent support to unimproved land. And what that is about is imagine that we are neighbors, right? There's the property line that runs between our parcels. And the neighbor proposes to put a swimming pool right up to the line. And the hole they are going to dig is going to cause a collapse on your side of the property line. You can stop them from doing that. And you don't need a separate negative easement to do that. They don't have the right to do something on their property that would deprive your property of lateral and subjacent support. Okay? If you want, however, a, a, the variation on that for where you would need the negative easement is Imagine that right up to the property line, you have built a house. They want to build a swimming pool that will come right up to the line. If there were no house there, their swimming pool would not cause a collapse, but it will cause a collapse of your house. In that case, you actually need a negative easement to prevent it because they are not obligated to support your house. They are obligated to support your dirt, but not your house. So if you're going to build a house, then you need to get a negative easement along the property line from that holder that they will never do anything that will undermine the house. But you don't have to do that just for your dirt. They can't do stuff that will undermine your dirt. Okay. Similarly, the airspace above your land that you can make reasonable use of, right? that you have automatically. And then water, there are special complicated riparian rights rules that you don't need to worry about. If you're going to practice in this area, you need to know it. If you're not, you don't need to worry about it. Okay? Uh, I have an instruction here, which is notes from I don't know when of working through. If you're guys working through this question on your own, what we will do is instead do it in a very quick way, because again, this is one of these very complicated ones. But let's go to the question and see if we can go from there. Okay? All right, so this is someone who wants to protect their view. Do you automatically have a negative easement for view? No, but you can get one. So if you were going to read this question, that's what you're reading for. You're reading for the easement for view. If there is no easement for view, there is no easement for view. Let's assume there isn't, and in that case, what is our answer? Okay, because no easement for light, error, or view. So again, obviously, when you're taking it, you can't be quite this quick, but you can know what you are looking for, and so you can be taken through a complicated story and not get distracted because you know what you're looking for and nothing else. An easement for light, air, or view has to be expressed. Yes. Huh? All right. Number 17? Yeah. Easements don't even have... Easements are property interests. It's covenants that we worry about whether they run with the land. Because covenants are contracts. They're not property interests. So co some covenants do and some don't run with the land. But the notion of running with the land is built into the easement. The easement belongs to the land we want to put it that way. Okay? All right. Uh, which of the following statements about the easement? Right. You will never see a question like that. Which of the following is most correct is a way they just do not ask the question anymore. So this is a question about mortgages, as we see about mortgage payments. The MBE likes to present situations in which monthly mortgage payments are due on property occupied by a life tenant with a remainder in somebody else. These questions are almost freebies if you just know the rule. Right, so what's the rule? We'll look in our shaded area. If property is mortgaged prior to a life estate becoming possessory, right, so it's mortgaged in the grantor, then we have a life estate and a remainder. The life tenant pays the interest, the remainder person pays the principal. That rule is easy, right? That's the rule, right? Now we'll read our question. Already, that is, there was already the payment. Okay, who owes what? Right, 
right. So which of the answers best expresses that? Easy. Uh, what's covered on page 87, as you recall, is really what we needed for question one. Right? So perhaps, in a proposed future revision, we will move this to page one. That is one of this section. Right? Because it's about eminent domain. But now, yeah, the whole thing, which we've gone through. We did it already. That is who has interests that are covered by the takings clause. Question 18 is a partial condemnation question that also connects to the rights of landlord and tenant as they relate. All right. But let's take a look. In case of partial condemnation, our rule, any landlord-tenant relationship will continue to the extent it can, and the tenant will still be obligated to pay the rent. So now let's read from the top. Right, so tw 10 acres remains in use. rent due? Yes. Okay, so which is, the, which is the better answer? Right. C is just out of left field. Right? Now, A might be tempting if you didn't recall the rule, but when you keep in mind that the condemnation award has been made to cover the loss, the condemnation award received by the tenant should have covered the rent, right? It should have been enough to allow him to satisfy his rent obligations. In fact, and then some, right? Because presumably he rented this to make money out of it, and after this condemnation he can't, right? And so to the extent, I mean, again, you want to know the rule just so you know it, right? But it's not an unreasonable rule, right, when you, when you think it through. Um, well, it's the better title, the superior title. Why are you asking? Who has paramount title? That means who can eject who. Sometimes it means who can eject who. Sometimes it means who will get paid first on a mortgage in a foreclosure situation. Ah, well, I think the situation that you're talking about is one where someone is ensuring somewhat, I mean, quiet enjoyment means undisturbed possession, right? And some, sometimes what is being represented is that no one, ha, no one will come in who has better title than you, right? So this is, this is actually a variation on A to B, A to C, right? So let's say A to B, right, with a lease that's going to start on the 1st of June, and then A to C with a lease that starts on March 1st, right? Well, when B shows up on June 1st, B actually has paramount title. B has better title than C. But if A has covenanted to protect C against that, then A will either be paying or A will be breaching against B and will take his lumps from B, right, because, the person, because B has title paramount to C's, okay, so right? It it's not this. Oh. No, it's not this. All right, next mortgage issue is on page 88, or a mortgage issue is on page 88A. And we are going to run a little over, we may run a little over three hours, and we also started a little late, so just be aware. I want to at least get through all the questions so that you have those. All right, question 19. 
Just start at the top. And what is the consequence of that? It does. The mortgage works a severance. It does indeed. Yes, the mortgage works a severance. So the rule is a mortgage works a severance. Yes, but then you want to look to see whether the answer is going to require you to make a distinction. So assume the mortgage works a severance and then look to the answers to see whether there's going to be, unless we're in a lien theory jurisdiction or something like that. Okay, go on. Right, so the question is, does T get everything or not? No, because there was a Before the death. Before right. the death. Right. It's now owned by Okay, and so which is, well, but are they both subject to the mortgage? No. Right, and so? No, because D is both subject oh, no, no, to the mortgage. Right. Right. Mortgage. right. Oh. right, you can't mortgage someone else's interest. That's the concept. You can't mortgage someone else's interest. Hmm? Oh, okay. Um, the mortgagee can transfer the mortgage if it's due on sale. Then the mortgagee can demand full payment if there is that transfer. If that transfer is made, no. If it has a due on sale clause, it actually has a due on sale or due on transfer clause. Yes, yes. The mortgagor can also transfer property, but that's, you know, can, can transfer to a third party and then be secondarily liable on the mortgage. Yeah. yeah. Page 88B, multiple mortgages and the right of redemption. That is redeem myself. The concept here is the thing called the right of redemption which allows mortgagors to redeem property prior to the foreclosure sale. And some have a statutory right of redemption that will actually allow the person who has defaulted on the mortgage to redeem after the foreclosure sale at the foreclosure price. But that's a statutory right. There's common law right of, the common law right of redemption ends at the foreclosure sale. There's sometimes a statutory right that goes even further. Some of the factors that can affect the priority of mortgages include recording statutes, subordination agreements that can make a subordinate mortgage senior, purchase money mortgages, which by law in some states are always senior to any other kind, modification of a senior mortgage to give priority to the junior mortgage, Why would a senior mortgagee do that? Or senior, mor yeah, senior mortgagee, why would they do that? For money. For money is why they would do it. They enter into an agreement with the junior mortgagee because the whole property is underwater right now and they don't think either of them is ever going to get their money and the junior mortgage is willing to give them $10,000 to subordinate or to otherwise modify. The junior mortgage also has priority over optional future advances by the senior mortgagee who knows of the junior mortgage. So you can't defeat the right, you can't know, this is the senior mortgage holder saying, pay me six months in advance and not them. Right? The junior mortgage holder in the event of foreclosure can get at some of that money. Because that's not, the senior mortgage isn't 100% senior in that way. But let's take a look at a question where it is a little bit in play and somewhat complicated on page 88C. Okay, whoever's next. Yes. Yeah. 
even apart from the, the substance of the law. But let's start at the top and figure out if we can see what's going on. So that's the first, oh, go on, go on. Right, so that's the first mortgage, you, okay, then. Okay, that's number two, okay. Okay, keep going. <laughs> okay. Okay, so now this is a conveyance, right, of the property with two mortgages on it, right? So we want to keep track of who's doing what, okay? Right, so you see what's happened, right? He buys property that has two mortgages on it, and now there's a third, okay? That's Zorn, okay? Do we care? Because? Constructive notice, right. Go on. Right, you get the idea. Oh, go on, right. That is not how it works. Right, you see what they're doing? She's loaning him $100,000 for him to use to pay off mortgage number one. But that won't make her mortgage number one. That will make her mortgage number two, right after the first one goes away, right? And U and M are not agreeing, right? And M in particular is not agreeing to subordinate his mortgage to Z's mortgage, okay? Okay, but so what? She's still number three in line, okay? Right, so that one's gone. So now we just leave Martin. Well, right, we have Martin and then we have Zorn, okay? Which it seems clearly to be. So now they say, right, if the court rules that Zorn's is entitled to priority, what will they need to find? So let's start reading. Well, she wants to take his place. It was. It was. Okay, so... Well, yes, because she wants to step into U's shoes. So U had better be senior to M, or it won't do any good to step into U's shoes. Right? Okay. Right. That's her theory. That's her theory of their arrangement, now described in fancier legal words because there's nothing else that's going to put her ahead of M because M never agreed to it. So she has to be put in U's place and that's the description of what it means to put her in U's place. Right, because if there are, they won't put Z ahead of her, of M. All of them, right, we need all of them, right? Z is our answer, we need all of them. That's a complicated question, for sure. It's just a lot. It's a lot to figure out. Right. Yeah. Okay. Next, 21, which is our last actual official question, and then I'll make a few comments if we want them. Oh, didn't we do this? Oh, we did it. It's a duplicate. It's a duplicate. Right? Ah, so we don't need to do it. We've actually already done it. Let me make a note. Well, good. We're ahead of ourselves. I crossed it and folded the paper in half, but I couldn't remember why. Okay. All right, so that's the last of the questions. We can talk through a little bit of the material that remains if you need it or have questions about it. Page 89, which comes before the vocabulary, this vocabulary to avoid. I don't, <laughs> I don't know that it is to be avoided other than 
the point that it's very unlikely that these are doctrines that are going to be required for coming up with the right answer. They are all legitimate doctrines that are part of the law of real property, but they're very unlikely to be the right answer in today's environment. Right? You can define them if you need them, right? but it's mostly, mostly to avoid them. Um, I think we'd, uh, we might want to just fill in what's on page 88E, which are duties of the landlord. There are certainly questions about these, but I assume you're encountering them in other materials. So what we have here are just the uh, remedies for breach of the implied warranty of habitability. The main thing that I would want to remind you about that in terms of when it tends to come up in questions and way, ways people tend to get tripped up by it is it does not apply to a commercial lease. The implied warranty of habitability is for residential leases only. Right? So that stay away from it. It doesn't matter what, you know, how many rats there are in the shoe store. It's not a violation of the implied warranty of habitability because there is no implied warranty of habitability except for residential leases. So that's, that's a thing that is easily tripped up. But if the implied warranty of habitability is breached, the tenant may terminate, right? That's like a constructive eviction theory. Make repairs and offset the, them against future rent. That sometimes, I mean, under statutory law, you may be familiar with it in your own life, although I hope not too often. It's called repair and deduct. Most states and municipalities provide for repair and deduct remedy, including California. Pay fair market value in the condition it's in. That's called abating the rent. You're not repairing, you're just cutting the rent. Or pay the full rent and sue for damages. These remedies are all available. All right, so if you encounter questions and issues in other MBEs or, frankly, essay questions in this area, um, I would be happy to address them. Otherwise, we're done.